So good morning, good morning everybody. Thank you very much for coming for today's uh, event, quite important event for, uh, for us, for the Aspen, uh, because the event is about the free media in our region. Uh, for us, for the Aspen Institute Central Europe, it's a part of the value-based leadership, uh, education, uh, digital stuff, this, the, 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 the topics which are tied with the democracy, with the open society, uh, free speech, are extremely important. And that's why we organize such event like this one. So welcome here personally, but also welcome many people online who are today with us. Um, when actually I uh, was uh, last, or no, it was this year, in May, in Miami, I met uh, Vivian and we discussed, I mean, a lot of the stuff about the possibility to make such uh, international event also here in the Czech Republic, but not for the Czech Republic, but for our region, for the Central Central Europe. And I'm very, very glad that uh, we agreed to do it here, and I'm very happy that uh, Vivian Schiller, the Executive Director of the Aspen Digital, uh, international expert in that area, will be also today moderator. So, Vivian, thank you very much for coming, and the floor is yours. Thank, thank you so much. Oh, am I working? Thank you so much, um, Melon. So, um, hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for being here, and thank you for those who are joining us online. Um, as Melon said, I am Vivian Schiller, Executive Director of Aspen Digital. Um, I, am, uh, I have had many jobs in my life and done many things, but in my heart, I consider myself a journalist, and I've worked in the news industry for, for many, many decades in the United States and around the world. It is a topic incredibly um, important to me and always will be. And um, by virtue of the fact that you're with us, I know it's important to you too. It should be important to everybody in the world. Um, so we all know that um, press freedom is in decline. Um, those of you are here because you're aware of it. Um, by every measurement, uh, it is shrinking. And particularly in this region, in Central Europe, Eastern Europe, in the former um, Soviet republics, those of us of a certain age remember um, after the Berlin Wall fell, after the end of the Soviet Union, there was a period of, of great hope, I think, um, throughout the world, but particularly in this region um, for many reasons, but that a, um, a, a free press might flourish and that there would be many, many news organizations covering the region without fear or favor, as the founder of the New York Times um, used to say. And for, uh, it seemed to be going that way. But here we are now in 2022, and unfortunately, we're seeing um, a reverse. And in some cases, um, like in Russia, things are even worse for the media, for the press, than they were during the Soviet era. I know, I lived there in Moscow in the 1980s. So um, this maps to the rise in illiberalism really all, all over the world. Um, it's exacerbated by the COVID pandemic and fueled by social media, which extracts our data to feed us um, uh, uh, content that really appeals to our basest instincts. It's really a perfect storm. Um, Today in the United States is election day. This is our midterm elections. It is a critical, critical election to see who will uh, control Congress, uh, which as you know has tremendous uh, power, um, particularly to um, stir up trouble, which uh, we anticipate. And, um, and so uh, attacks on a free press um, are one of the things that I'm most concerned about. Uh, in these elections. We are two years past um, the term of uh, a president who called uh, the free press uh, the enemy of the people. Words I never in my entire life imagined I would hear coming out of the mouth of the president of the United States. Uh, but here we are, and his many followers agree. Um, the rise of Fox News at a national level and the rise of what we call pink slime slights at the local level, which is basically partisan propaganda masquerading as journalism, um, is really uh, changing the nature of, of how people understand uh, and how tethered they are to the reality-based world. And um, many people that I talk to in the world and says, if we see free press declining in the United States, then there's not a lot of hope. 
for anybody else. Um, so no wonder um, autocrats are emboldened. But what I'm particularly excited about today is um, we have a group of people who I consider my heroes. They are all working um, in the region um, to tell the important stories that the public needs to be able to be engaged citizens in the world. And so um, we owe them our support. I'm excited to be speaking with them. And hopefully we're going to hear what we all can do to try to continue to support um, media in the region. Um, before, we, before we go on, I just want to say a couple of thank yous. Um, particular thank you to uh, Milan and the entire staff of Aspen Central Europe who have been spectacular partners and have embraced um, this idea um, from when uh, we had that conversation over lunch. Uh, that's how the best ideas start. So hopefully this is just the beginning of doing more on this effort. I also want to thank um, um, those that provided us um, uh, some funding for today, which includes uh, Microsoft and the um, Bacala Foundation. So thank you to them. Um, luckily, we are uh, having this discussion in the Czech Republic, uh, which has uh, one of the healthiest, unfortunately we, were here, we will hear about not so healthy, but uh, healthiest um, public media uh, uh, television um, station in the world, which is really exciting. It's public television that serves the public interest, which exactly is as it should be. So with that, uh, oh no, I'm going to the video first, I think, right? Oh, okay. All right, we're going to the video first, sorry. Um, so uh, first, uh, we're gonna show you a short video. This is from um, Ambassador Mark Gittenstein. He is the US ambassador to the European Union, um, who I had the honor to have dinner with and meet with um, a few weeks ago in Brussels. And um, they have made it uh, part of the mission um, of, the, uh, of their mission uh, in, in Brussels uh, to do what they can to support um, uh, sustainable, free, independent media. So he couldn't be with us today, but he wanted to say a few words, and then I'll, we'll come, I'll come back to you. I wish I could join you in person, and I thank the Aspen Institute, and in particular Vivian Schiller, for her work and her leadership on this critical issue. Technology has forever altered how we consume information, while journalists are increasingly under attack from governments who want to suppress their voice and control their work. This is one of the crucial challenges of our time, and the Aspen Institute's work to shine a light on global issues in the information ecosystem is vital. Media freedom is a pillar of democracy. Journalists and investigative reporters hold governments to account by exposing corruption and informing citizens on issues most important to their lives. Independent media ensure governments are more responsive and responsible to their people. It is the first and best tool to expose wrongdoing and preserve and strengthen democracy. Across the world, we see a free press is the first target of authoritarians. Leaders like Vladimir Putin know that independent media, media that can expose their corruption and contempt for the rule of law, is the biggest threat to their rule. The United States is working with partners in government and civil society to expose and prosecute corruption and support good governance. We are strengthening civilian tools such as investigative journalism and reporting mechanisms, tools which will help us raise the cost of corruption. The United States is also building alliances of like-minded partners to confront corruption and working with government and civil society worldwide to improve transparency. To bring about real change in the fight against corruption, we need to deepen our partnerships with and raise the profile of civic actors. As one of America's greatest presidents, Franklin Roosevelt, wrote on the eve of our entry into World War II, quote, freedom of conscience, of education, of speech, of assembly, are all among the very fundamentals of democracy, and all of them would be nullified should freedom of the press ever be successfully challenged, unquote. 
This conversation is a key part of that effort to preserve fundamentals. On behalf of the U.S. mission to the European Union, I thank all of you for your interest and your participation in this critical issue. Okay, thank you. And now I'm very pleased to introduce um, Pieter Dvorak, the CEO of Czech Television, for more than 10 years, I think. Um, uh, he has led it to record viewership, and um, we are just so pleased to have you here today. So, uh, Thank you for inviting me. If you put the camera to the table, I will put my... I will put my iPad there. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning, everyone. It's a great honor uh, for me to open the broadcast news panel discussion. And in my opening speech, I would like to concentrate on the subject of how fragile media today is. A global pandemic, war in Ukraine, or a rising inflation across Europe. More than ever, the crisis of recent years have shown once again how important the role of free media is in any healthy democratic society. At the same time, we often have to fight long-term battles to preserve their independence. We in the Czech Republic do not need a great imagination to imagine a world in which there are no free media. Until 1989, we lived in such a situation for 40 years. And the truth is that we have seen hints of this state affairs return from time to time, not only here, but also in other countries of the Eastern Bloc. The causes of such a development are complicated and complex. They are on one hand a global phenomena that lead to the erosion of values which we have accepted for decades. But on the other hand, they are also purely local, in case of the Czech Republic, quite specific and personalized. Therefore, I would like to take you through a short story of how Czech Republic has fallen from the 13th place in the Global World Press Freedom Index to the place 40 in just five years. And I believe it will be a story to learn from. Some of you may know the story, but I believe it is important to be reminded it from it from time to time. For a long time after Velvet Revolution, in 1989, the media in the Czech Republic belonged to the various large uh, foreign media companies. Czech businessmen, however, soon discovered that while owning media might not be too interesting from the business perspective, it made sense from the influence perspective. Andrei Babish, businessman, politician, even the chairman of the strong populist party, the finance minister, and later also the prime minister, was one of those who bought a large media house in 2013. His entry into the media market resulted into the concentration of the political, business, and media power in the hands of one single person. That same moment, the public service media became his competitor, and also a target of the critical political rhetoric of Babish and also his party members. I remember various things from that time. I remember the moments when he publicly attacked our journalists, calling them corrupted trash, when he refused to give them information, when he refused to appear on our programs. I remember pressure in the form of legislative proposals to decrease or even abolish our license fee. I remember lying anonymous pamphlets, so-called audits, spread in the Czech parliament accusing Czech TV and myself of distorting information, non-transparent management or even criminal offenses. At the same time, Criticizing Czech TV became part of the political campaign of another important political figure of the Czech Republic, 
Czech president Miloš Zeman. Undermining trust in the Czech TV and on the contrary, strengthening the unregulated, more marginal and sometimes even disinformation media was important part of his agenda. And on top of that, you can add far-right parties and politicians for whom challenging the public media will always be their agenda. As a result, as a result of this pressure on Czech TV and Czech radio, the Czech Republic fell 27 places down on the World Press Freedom Index between 2014 and 2019. But however, the pressure on Czech TV continued in the following years. After the public criticism of the Czech TV, its news coverage and its management from the country's highest constitutional officials didn't work, after tens of thousands, sometimes even hundreds, thousands of people protested in the square in favor of the Czech TV, after, leading, after laws leading to the economic starvation of the public service media were not passed by the parliament, the pressure took the form of staffing media councils. The media councils here in the Czech Republic have many competencies. And the newly elected members were tasked with destabilizing Czech TV, influencing its decision making and especially its news and public affairs coverage and ideally also changing its management, including the director general, followed by the dismissal of editor-in-chief and several well-known journalists. Frankly speaking, it was extremely difficult period. A period when I seriously wondered whether I had the strength to fight such a pressure any longer, but we made it. Thanks also to the support of many international institutions including EBU, Council of Europe, International Unions of Journalists, and many, many others. Thanks a lot for that support. In 2021, the Czech Republic still ranked number 40 on the World Press Freedom Index. This year, it jumped back to the number 20. What happened? There was a democratic election. It was won by the, diff uh, by the different political coalition which, on the contrary, regards the stability of the media, including the public service media, as its goal. The current government and the current ruling coalition came with a proposal to include the Senate into the selection of media council members, and we are at the moment negotiating a change of our financing to be stable, predictable, and independent from the political pressures. That's a good news. But the bad news is how unstable the media situation in the center of Europe can be. However, knowledge is power. Therefore, I'm glad that today we have the opportunity to exchange our experiences, opinions, and best practice between each other. Many thanks to the Aspen Institute, Central Europe, and Aspen Digital for this opportunity. Many thanks to my colleagues who have come here today and to people who are watching us online and who care about the positive future of the independent and free media in Europe. Enjoy the day and enjoy the event. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We're so glad you could, you could kick us off this morning. Um, we're now going to go into our, our first panel. Um, it's great to start with at least that Good news that that Czech TV is for now thriving as a as a as public media. Unfortunately, some of our panelists uh, you will hear from today are going to tell a different story. So let me introduce them. Um, so we have, and then as I introduce you, please come up and, and take a seat. I'm going to sit here, so you all can just sit wherever you like over here. We're very organized, as you can see. Uh, so I'd like to introduce uh, Tihon um, uh, Giadko. He is the editor in chief of uh, TV Dojd. Uh, uh, in Russia, although as you can see, he is not in Russia now. That's TV Rain. Um, uh, Tejon started with uh, Reporters Without Borders, the, which is the organization, of course, uh, that puts out that index ranking of press freedom as well. Um, he was a reporter and host um, for Echo Moskvi and others, and has been editor in chief of TV Doge since 2019. 
uh, Jamie Fly, uh, President and um, CEO of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, uh, previously co-director of the Alliance for Security, Democracy, and director of the Future of Geopolitics and Asia programs at the German Marshall Fund in the United States, also served as counselor to Senator Marco Rubio and in the George W. Bush administration. Um, Brigida uh, Grishiak is deputy editor-in-chief and head of standards and practices uh, for TVN24 in Poland, um, which is not the public television uh, news network um, for reasons that will become obvious uh, why they are not here. Um, uh, Brigida has been with TVN um, for 23 years um, in just about every wall, winning awards and writing books along the way. And uh, finally, um, Martin uh, Dre uh, Drezencheck, sorry, I'm trying very hard, um, <laughs> Deputy Editor-in-Chief of uh, Czech Television um, and reporter and um, host, uh, previously worked in both uh, here in Prague and in London for the Czech Editorial Office of the BBC, and is the representative of Czech Television in the European Broadcasting Union, who brings that interesting perspective. Also, uh, have won many awards and, and written books, lots of books and awards um, around this table, which is absolutely wonderful. So um, just so that you all know the plan, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we're going to have a conversation amongst ourselves uh, uh, for a little while. Um, and then um, I'm going to get, open it up to the room so that we can hear your questions. And I've got my little trusty iPad here. So those that are online, you can submit your questions Online, I believe it is probably obvious in the system how to do that, and uh, so I'll, I'll, we'll get to those a little bit later. But first, I really am excited to, to begin with um, our panelists today. Just to and what we're going to start is for each of you. I just really want you to sort of set the scene. Um, tell us about your news organization and give us a little bit of the context in which you are uh, operating. Um, and uh, and then um, a little bit we're going to talk about, sort of open the aperture and talk a little bit about uh, risks overall and, of course, uh, where we go for here, where we go uh, from here, next steps, best, best practices, and concrete recommendations. So, um, Martin, I'm going to, if you forgive me, I'm going to go in order of sort of declining press freedom. Um, uh, well, I'm, Jamie, you're did separate, so we'll, I'm going to move. Le I'm going to keep you out of that particular progression. We'll come. We'll come to you in a few minutes, and start with you, Martin. So, of course, we heard from your we heard from your boss, uh, but we'd love to hear a little bit more uh, uh, detail about um, Czech TV and how you operate, and and a little bit more about the context here in the Czech Republic. Although we will call on you a little bit later to ask you about the broader European context as well. Of course, of course. Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for uh, inviting me. I just learned that it's going to be streamed, and I have my boss in the house, so yeah, I, yeah. I, my my responses may be somewhat limited. Um, no, um, on a serious note, the, the situation here in the Czech Republic is uh, has been going up and down uh, in the last, I would say, decade or 15 years that I've been with Czech TV, and I can see that on the or in, on the foreign desk, for example, and what we do internationally, our correspondents abroad, I. I'm honored to be on that team. Um, I think we're, the Czech TV has been doing a great job domestically as well. It's the, the, the overwhelming pressure that is sometimes taking its toll on, on the stress that we face and so on. It doesn't have to be on an everyday basis. But knowing that it's out there, that, for example, the, the former prime minister is not going to talk to us on our shows, he declines to, to be interviewed. Um, that's something, and also, you know, female, for example, journalists in the parliament being attacked by, verbally attacked by, by politicians. This is something that you don't really, you know, you can't get really ready for. And, and it's, it's every day. It's not that we would have our offices uh, raised by, by the police or anything like that. And hopefully it's not going to happen anytime soon. But it, it's the, the subtle pressure that, that we're facing here that is not pleasant. But... Knowing the situation in Poland, for example, with, with uh, the public service television there and how much change when the government came in a couple of years ago, um, knowing what's happening in Hungary, knowing what's happening, uh, you know, the Easter you go from Czech Republic, I know that it's, it's fragile and I know how 
you know, lucky we are that we're in the position that my boss described a while ago. But but it is, you know, you're, what you're describing, though, uh, uh, is uh, sort of the beginnings, uh, sort of the early stages of attacks on oppressed freedom, public officials who refuse to, to interview with you, um, verbal attacks on journalists, which riles up the public. You're seeing that increase. And um, I, I can't really say if it's increasing or not. You're living in the environment, so you don't have the, yeah. the, the benefit yeah. of the distance. Um, but it's definitely not pleasant, I would say. And seeing how fragile things are and how, how badly they can turn almost over, uh, overnight, you have to be on a constant watch. We had a similar dis discussion, and we're probably going to get um, back to it later on, at EBU in Geneva a couple of weeks ago. Um, and when you look at the, the, the European media, public service media landscape, you see that in, in the north, Scandinavia, Sweden, and, and Finland, they're, they're never talking about money. They have, subtle in um, they have stable income, not subtle, stable income. And they can concentrate on digitalization. They can concentrate on things that really move us forward. Then you have Central and Eastern Europe, which is still fighting for, for its very existence, um, and not really having enough income for, for big progress and, and so on, because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's just what it is. Then you have Western Europe, uh, France and the UK, with their major fights for, for media independence and, and income. BBC, uh, France TV, look at what Macron did uh, a couple of months ago regarding the, the fees. And then you have um, Southern Europe, which is kind of you know, hanging in there, and, and it's just not a pleasant picture to look at. And we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, sustainability in a little while because press freedom and, sust and sustainability of a business are, are inextricably um, intertwined. So we'll come back to you. Um, Brigida, um, talk to us a little bit about um, uh, TVN and uh, 24 and give us the context of the environment in, in Poland right now for news media. Thanks a lot. I'm almost sure my boss doesn't watch us, so... I can be, you know. <laughs> um, just to give you a sense of the situation in Poland, I will refer to this World Media Freedom uh, Index. We used to be 18th in 2015, and now we are 66th. So that's the circumstances we are discussing now. Even though I wouldn't say we are fragile as a, lean, a media landscape in Poland, uh, also as TVN24. TVN24 is uh, why I, I said so, because I have an impression, and our results show that, that uh, mo the more um, government attacks us, the higher ratings we have, and the more solidarity of our viewers we have. When the uh, ruling party introduced the law that uh, tried to force our, our owner to sell us, in a sense, uh, and to sell us probably to some Polish businessman who we would just like explain to the, have the ownership of TV. Yes, we are American, um, American ownership. We uh, use uh, B scripts, uh, then Discovery, and, then, uh, and now we are Discovery, Warner Bros. Discovery, so huge. Uh, world media company and actually not so long ago but Saturday uh, the um, uh, leader of law and justice so ruling party in Poland said openly then they did not shut us down actually only because we are American now I mean we've got this American support it's sad but that's the fact so we cannot feel offended by this we, are, we feel motivated to work um, um, later on. I think we'll discuss it later. What I wanted to say, we are the biggest news um, TV channel in Poland. I would say the only uh, one which is truly independent now, without any uh, impact uh, from the government side. And um, <clears throat> with the highest ratings and uh, the most popular still. Uh, I've been luck I am lucky to have been working here for 20 or oh, 21 years. So, um, but yes, I will emphasize on this fragile being fragile. I don't think we are fragile now. Fragile now. Uh, it's good to say uh, that's the point to our discussion. But I, I, I will say, tell about this later on um, about the mechanism we introduced to answer to this um, attacks and uh, to the situation. Thank you. But to be clear, unlike um, here in the Czech Republic, um, 
the public broadcaster, TVP, is not an independent broadcaster in the sense of does not have editorial freedom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what would you just mentioned in Poland, um, state TV is a pure propaganda. I mean, Vivian knows it well. And um, uh, it also works uh, as a company, as a friend of government, in the sense that w when someone attacks us, I mean, uh, one politician or the other attacks us, then state media just multiply it. So it works so. It's trying to undermine our credibility, but it doesn't work effectively so, yeah. so far. So not only are they not independent, but they're attacking free media. Jamie, I'm going to skip you for a minute, um, because as I said, we're, there is a specific uh, order that we're going here. And um, so uh, Tihon, um obviously, uh, by the way, in case it wasn't obvious, and you can see on the name, this is broadcast and television um, journalism that we're talking about. And our next panel is going to be... Um, sort of print slash digital um, with a different set of journalists. So, um, but the fact remains that in most countries in the world, uh, broadcast television is still the, you know, the, probably the most watched media. So, um, Tichon, um, uh, TV Doge, you were a, uh, a thriving um, news broadcaster in Russia, and uh, now... Uh, you're not in Russia. So get, tell us a little bit about TV Dodged and tell us about your situation today. Well, our situation is much, is much less complicated than yours because you are, you are saying that your situation is fragile. The situation with press, press freedom in Russia is not fragile because there is no press freedom. So it's much, it's much easier. Uh, and uh, it, it has never been easy uh, over the last 20 years, but with the beginning of the war, everything has changed. And um, it, was, it was obvious that the beginning of the war would mean the beginning of the end of the of, of last remaining independent media uh, in, uh, in Russia. And it actually happened on the uh, fifth day of the war. Uh, our website and um, a lot of websites of other independent media were blocked in Russia. A radio station like of Moscow, the last independent radio, st radio station, was uh, was closed. Uh, we were shut down in a, in a cable network out in in, in uh, Russian regions, and. Um, uh, on March 3rd, uh, Russian parliament uh, adopted a new legislation on so-called fake news information about Russian military activities in Ukraine. And the second law is about discreditation of Russian army in Ukraine, which means that if you are spreading any kind of information uh, telling the truth about Russian army in Ukraine, you could face up to 15 years in jail. Because if you if you are telling that Russian soldiers killed people in Bucha and it was not confirmed by a Russian Ministry of Defense, then you are spreading fake news information. Uh, so, so more than 5,000 websites were blocked in Russia, uh, and all independent, independent, almost all independent journalists left left the, left the country, such as our journalists from TV Rain, uh, from. Uh, uh, March till mid-July, we were not operating. We were considering our options and where to relaunch. And on July 11th, we relaunched TV Rain. Now we have three, uh, three studios. The, the one and the main is in Riga, Latvia. Also, we have a studio in Tbilisi, in Georgia, and in Amsterdam, in Netherlands. And uh, of course, our main goal is to reach as many viewers as possible in in in, in Russia. Uh, unfortunately, uh, TV Rain could be seen now in Russia only on YouTube, and we see that 65% of our viewers on YouTube are from Russia. For example, in uh, in October, it was uh, around 13 million unique viewers, 30 million uh, people, which means that the level of uh, request for the independent information in Russia is really is really high. How does that compare to before the war? Before the war, it was it was more. 
uh, it was around 16 million on on YouTube and a couple of millions on uh, on cable cable networks. But it's just the beginning. We see that the the number is growing, and uh, a lot of people, unfortunately, they 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 thought that TV Rain was dead, and maybe they were right. But now it's not dead, so it it takes time to to tell them that we're we're still alive, and especially since Facebook is blocked, Twitter is blocked. Instagram is blocked. Not a lot of people are using VPN services, so you you have to take more efforts to to get to the uh, to the audience. Uh, of course, we have a, a lot of um, restrictions, such as these uh, blocked websites, such as legislations on foreign agents. For example, me myself, I was uh, labeled as a foreign agent a couple of weeks ago, and it. It, it, it doesn't help in uh, in uh, in your job, uh, and also we have um, we are experiencing two types of problems. The first type is um, uh, is problems with the papers and with the uh, visas and documents and everything in Europe. The second uh, the second of course is with the fundings because uh, before the war we were very happy that for two years we were feeding us by, by ourselves with the subscriptions from our viewers and with the monetization of YouTube and donations of our viewers. Now, uh, we, the situation is, um, is difficult to us because on the one hand, we know that we want as, as many viewers from Russia as possible, but at the same time we get zero dollars and zero cents from the monetization on YouTube from Russia because it is stopped by YouTube, which in my opinion doesn't make any sense because they blocked all the propaganda YouTube channels. And uh, if you look at Russian speaking YouTube, it's only opposition and independent media and they could not get money from, from, from viewers in Russia. So, um, so yeah, so that's what we are st struggling with. But um, again, we see that uh, people in Russia are still eager to get independent information, and we we see that the number of viewers is growing, which is really important for for us to continue doing what we're doing. Thank you. I've, we've got many, many more questions for you, but we'll come back to that um, in a little a little bit. Um, so, Jamie, you're in a in a unique situation, um, at least among these panelists. So, talk to us a little bit about. Um, um, Radio Free Europe and um, and your work here and the context you operate in. Sure. Um, so I, I have the luxury or maybe the pain of looking across 23 markets, and including some of the ones we've been discussing. Um, so it does give me a perspective on some broader trends that we see at Radio Free Europe. Um, we operate here in Prague. We're based here since 1995, after we were invited here by Václav Havel, uh, who was a big supporter of our work. Uh, in the 80s leading up to the Velvet Revolution. And we're funded by the U.S. Congress, so that we're funded by the U.S. taxpayer. And our mission is to provide local surrogate journalism uh, in countries where it's under attack. The challenge in recent years is that list is, of countries is growing, so we're actually uh, in the process right now of returning to uh, old markets, markets that we left in the 90s. Uh, in those optimistic days when, I think as you noted, Vivian, that the assumption was that independent media would flourish, uh, there wouldn't be a need for Radio Free Europe. There was actually a debate in the U.S. Congress at the time about shutting us down uh, in the 19, early 1990s, and really only because of Havel's uh, invitation to the U.S. government to move us here, as well as then Senator Biden's work uh, in the Senate, uh, which led to the International Broadcasting Act, which governs us, those were really the two individuals that helped ensure that we survived for this moment where the economic model for media has collapsed. Uh, authoritarians in the following decades quickly realized there was a new model. You didn't need to set up necessarily the same sort of propaganda networks that most of uh, the governments tried to use during the Cold War. You could be much more subtle. You could use market forces uh, to have friendly oligarchs buy up media uh, that were active in the political space. You could then control the discourse that way. You could easily co-opt the public broadcasters, which is the warning sign we see in almost every market we operate in. Uh, I, I call it the canary in the coal mine. Uh, if you see the public broadcaster become co-opted, you can pretty much predict what will follow. And it'll be 
uh, an information landscape that's just marked by conspiracy theories and chaos. Uh, and so those are the markets where we are supposed to be operating in. Uh, we cannot be the only solution, but we're part of the solution in providing objective news and information. Um, the other thing I should note, though, these challenges are global, as was noted. It's happening here in the Czech Republic. It's happening in Western Europe, this broader situation with decline of media, uh, information uh, confusion in a lot of those media landscapes. It's happening in the United States. And so some of the debates that Petter was talking about with Czech TV, there are similarities even to some debates about Radio for Europe in recent years, which I'm happy to talk about. Um, but that's the concerning thing, that really no one is off limits, and no uh, media outlet has been spared from this, um, no matter how significant the safeguards are. Uh, and the authoritarians are taking advantage of that. And in our case, um, like our colleagues working in, in Russia and elsewhere, the challenge has been how to keep your journalists safe and how to stay in the market when you're getting shut down, uh, when you're getting designated a foreign agent. Uh, and even in the more extreme version, uh, which we're starting to see in Belarus, where the audience now becomes potentially criminals for consuming information, which I fear is maybe where we're headed in Russia. And so these are the sorts of challenges that we're grappling with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but you know, I'll leave the more optimistic assessment for in the conversation, but I completely agree that the, the trends we see with the audiences, though, continue to hearten us because we see people continue to want to seek out independent, truthful information despite what the authoritarians are doing to prevent them from accessing that content. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with you for a minute, um, Jamie, as we begin to segue. I want to talk a little bit about um, funding and sustainability. Uh, but first I want to say it's just the notion that you know, in the early 1990s, the notion was you didn't need a radio for Europe because free press would flourish throughout the region forever is quite a statement. But when it comes to sustainability, you're funded, like you said, by U.S. Congress. There is debate about it. And in fact, uh, we saw an episode not too long ago where uh, you were effectively maybe not shut down, but there was a trajectory uh, along which... Uh, your journalistic freedom, um, which is enshrined in the way that Radio Free Europe and Voice of America are set up, was at jeopardy. Just talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, the good thing I'll say on the funding is we continue to have strong bipartisan support, and we just got our first funding increase in five or six years, uh, just as uh, Putin invaded Ukraine. Um, obviously, it's still not enough. We've got significant challenges. Uh, and despite some of the political debates in the U.S. in recent years about cutting back the international affairs budget, for the most part, we've been spared. Um, we don't have as many resources as we'd like, uh, but we haven't had to deal with significant uh, budget cuts, although that's always a, a potential challenge. It is election day. Yes. <laughs> um, the challenge we've had is this debate about control uh, and whether we should remain editorially independent. That's enshrined in the International Broadcasting Act, which then Senator Biden uh, led in the Senate. Um, but there's a broader debate in the U.S., uh, and I think it plays out in, in Britain with the BBC and elsewhere about what are, what are these countries getting from these international media outlets? Should you just fund media for the sake of funding media, or should you be really getting something strategic in return? And that's really the debate that played out in the late part of the Trump administration. Uh, I think our colleagues at Voice of America often get the worst of this because part of their mission is telling America's story, and there's an uh, ever-changing debate about what is America's story right now in politically contested uh, times. Uh, our mission is a little bit removed from that because we really focus on local journalism in the countries that we're working in. But that played out with a power grab, essentially, in the superstructure in Washington that oversees us and funds us. Uh, where all of the network heads, including myself, uh, who run the networks, were all fired in mass uh, by the Trump administration appointee once he took office. Uh, and thankfully, uh, Republicans and Democrats in Congress immediately responded, held hearings, began to change the law uh, to actually put in, in place safeguards to make sure that that cannot happen again. It reminded me, uh, Petter's comments reminded me of this. We're, we're going through that in the U.S. There's a legislation actually pending in the next month that will further strengthen our safeguards to make sure that one individual connected to one administration cannot make that sort of power grab. 
Um, but it was a difficult time. I was obviously removed, uh, living in Berlin at that time, but uh, my editorial team here really had to stand up. Our editorial board all signed a, a joint letter to our funders in Washington, basically confronting them and saying, this is unacceptable. It compromises our editorial integrity and our ability to operate in places like Russia, Belarus, where we're under significant pressure. Um, so I think, like here in the Czech Republic, we're headed in a better direction, but it was a reminder that that danger is always lurking there uh, on the margins. And uh, it came at a really difficult time just for us as Vladimir Putin was trying to modify the foreign agent law to target us with the labeling requirement, uh, which ultimately became the way that they, uh, the Kremlin forced us to close our, our physical bureau in, in Moscow. And while our team was trying to deal with that, they also had to have these worries about our independence uh, from our stakeholders in Washington. So yeah, that the notion that you should be, that Voice of America ready for Europe should be, again, sort of a, a a propaganda uh, engine, which luckily was resolved, but you know it just shows how we we, we cannot rest, which coming back to you uh, martin so um, again, thinking about funding and sustainability, so uh, your funding is entirely uh, t tell us about your funding structure it 's uh, it's license fee based structure like the BBC. most of it comes from fees, maybe Peter would have uh, you know, a little more to add, but it's it 's fee based. The fee hasn't changed for 14 years. So imagine running a company, a business that whose budget hasn't changed for 14 years. How, how, how can you innovate? How can you digitalize? The, the world is changing. The Czech TV Act, for example, doesn't count on having online presence at all, for example. And online is a big thing for us, for everyone. So you know the law and the, the level of fees um, is, is obsolete. It comes from a different century almost. Well, in fact, it does in, in the case of the, the TV Act. <laughs> And, um, and Brigitte, with, uh, with TVN, you have uh, multiple sources of, uh, of revenue. Oh, sorry. We have to, sorry about my Sorry, sorry. It's yeah. okay. We will share it. Uh, we are a private TV station, but uh, coming back to the license, because I didn't give you the broad context of it. Uh, uh, last year, summer, we were waiting for one year and a half for ex uh, extending our license. There were no, you know, either legal or meritorical either um, uh, circumstances that uh, would somehow um, uh, go against. So, uh, and they prolonged our license uh, one uh, working day before it was to expire. So that's the kind of pressure we have in, uh, in Poland. And uh, one additional, um, additional issue, uh, we cover 65% of households in Poland. So uh, we, we don't cover the whole Poland. Mm, so the competition with the state TV is not so balanced. Um, they impact on society, maybe, but it's not maybe uh, stronger than, um, than ours. Um, so when it comes to financing, we have, I would say it's always good to have more money to in, in, in some, um, make some innovations, etc. But that's not our problem. Um, the problem was not only for our TV and 24, but for all the media outlets in Poland, I think. We've got one, uh, we've got, we are the biggest one in Poland, yes, with American money. And even though... Uh, Polish government attacked us in a legis legislative way. That's why 100 and 1,300 uh, editors in chief signed some letter of support for us because they thought they were sure that when they can, can attack and um, you know shut us down, they would do it with everyone. So that was symbolic, I think, the biggest media outlet in Poland um, facing such troubles. I mean. Not only this license one, but also this legislation I mentioned before. So, trying to change our structure. Um, yeah, that would do. Uh, I think that today we we have there is always a danger. There is always, you know, you, you need to be be you know uh, cautious of it. Um, but we are trying to work as if um, there weren't any. So, trying to do our best to cover stories in Poland. But your sources of revenue also are in some ways under tax. So your yes. sources of revenue are advertising. Tell us the, what... The, yeah, yeah, of course. But it's not, not only about us, but all private outlets in Poland, media outlets in Poland. So it's obvious that for um, um, 
government-friendly media outlets uh, much more money from advertising. Yes, for us not, but we are big from the government. From the government, yes, and for our, our state-controlled uh, companies. Uh, what is more, I didn't mention it before. Um, last year, uh, the biggest petrol um, state control company um, bought 20, more than 20 dailies, uh, local dailies in Poland, and tens of uh, websites and uh, also weeklies. So, um, in a sense, they have, um, they took over a local media um, landscape in Poland. So uh, coming back to your questions and advertising and stuff, they cannot, they can just buy uh, outlets they need. So um, that's the trend that is interest. It's not only Polish, I know. It's, uh, like, uh, this, it's, it's um, a trend uh, all over the world, not only in Europe. Yeah, I know in the, ne in the next panel we're going to be talking quite a bit uh, with the others, not only about uh, uh, state pressure, but that news organizations that are being bought by oligarchs are those friendly to the state. So that is, hap that is a model, maybe not quite as much in television, but certainly in uh, newspapers and online. Um, Tikhon, um, you, you, know, you, you mentioned earlier that your, um, uh, you know, your, well, tell us about your revenue picture. Obviously, so much of it has now been cut off, as you say, the demonetization of uh, YouTube and the sanctions. Yeah, so uh, before the war, as I, uh, as I mentioned, we were feeding us by ourselves. We 60% of our revenue uh, was coming from subscriptions and uh, also from donations from our viewers, monetization of YouTube and uh, a little bit of uh, advertising since there was a ban on uh, for advertisers to work with us, uh, and uh, from the distribution. Now, of course, this system is absolutely collapsed because uh, our website still is blocked in Russia, so there is no subscription. Uh, it's hard for people to uh, donate because of the problems with the, with the cards, so there are just a few s services where they can donate and also the economies, economic situation in Russia is worse than before the war. So now, uh, unfortunately, we are very much um, depend on donors, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, grants. Of course, we're very grateful, but it's not the world where we uh, want to live and it's not the world where we used to live and where we uh, love to live because we don't want to be uh, we don't want to depend on on anyone, even though we we have a strong principle that we are not taking money from the governments. Uh, but still, that's not what we. I mean, we 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 want to earn money for for ourselves by ourselves. Uh, so now we we have um, we still have money from YouTube uh, from views outside of Russia, but if we compare with the views from Russia, it's, it's, very, it's very sad. Uh, we still have donations from uh, our viewers um, from Russia and outside of Russia, and now we are trying to uh, get audience, uh, English-speaking audience. We launched the YouTube channel in, in English. It is called TV and Newsroom, where weekly we are making a show about uh, news f from Russia in Russian, like point uh, point of view, and we uh, launched the uh, fundraising on GoFundMe, uh, and we are hoping for for the possibility of advertising in in cable networks in the, in uh, in Europe. But again, we are very much dependent on 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 donors now. But we hope that the situation will will change in a, in a, in a couple of months. We're a thriving commercial business, and now you're having to act like a not-for-profit or a charity, which is um, quite a big that's correct quite a big change. Um, so uh, the so the but with the English language might service is is giving you other revenue opportunities, as I understand it. Well, we hope so because we um, when the war uh, when the war started and when uh, TV rain these uh, five days of the war that TV rain was operating from Moscow. We had something like 120 million views per per per, per day uh, on 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 YouTube, and uh, when uh, TV Rain was shut down, it was a big deal. 
for international press, and we got a lot of uh, a lot of support from from the people abroad. And um, I think it was a moment when a lot of people who never knew that free press existed in Russia understood that free press actually existed in Russia. And um, now we want to show them that this this press still exists, and it could tell them about the situation in English better, maybe than their own media outlets. Because we, even though we are not in Russia anymore, but we understand the situation better than than they, with all due respect. And uh, we hope that after that, they would be the viewers from 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 abroad would be ready to, to support our, our, our work as well. So I, I want to stick with you for a minute um, as, we, uh, as we move towards um, talking a little bit about, I want to talk about the risks, the day-to-day -day risks for your journalists um, everywhere. So um, Tukhan, you are you, your, the all TV Rain staff uh, is outside of Russia now. I'm sure that doesn't make you feel like you're without risk. And like you say, you got uh, visa issues too, which can't help. Um, but I want, I want you to talk a little bit about um, your risks as uh, you're perceived as Russians in Europe, even though you are journalists who are reporting the truth about Russia. And, and then I want to ask you about um, how you think about the safety and security of your sources who are still inside Russia? Well, these are two different... Yeah, they're two different very topics. different things, yeah. Uh, the, the first thing about security, uh, we are absolutely secure. And, uh, for example, if we compare uh, with the journalists who are working in Ukraine or with the journalists who are still in Russia, we are fine. Of course, we are, we are annoyed by the situation with visas and something else, but it's, that's nothing if we compare it to the situation on the ground. Um, we, uh, of course, all, all of our staff is not, is not in Russia because uh, TV Rain is still a f foreign agent. Uh, technically not, because now we have a new, new company. But we are being cons by, by the government, we are being considered as a, as a foreign agent. And uh, what is more important, we are being considered as an enemy because they forced us to leave. And it was, we think that it was, it was a plan because we, there were uh, rumors in Moscow that they were going to arrest our journalists and to raid our office. I was receiving threats. Our news director was receiving threats, but nothing happened. We, we left and we, at least we don't know that there are criminal cases against us. It, it could happen, but, but we don't know. But, but when I'm saying that we are being considered as an enemy is because they, they force us to leave and we relaunch for some reason. Of course, they are annoyed with this fact, and we are waiting to be designated as so-called undesirable organization, which is worse than, than being a foreign agent. Uh, that's why, of course, we don't have uh, our reporters there. But we have we have some stringers. We have uh, uh, people who are um, uh, helping us with information on an uh, anonymous uh, basis. Uh, and um, uh, of course, it's easier when when we were relaunching TV Rain. We were afraid of losing the touch of reality in Russia. But fortunately, now it's not 1970. We are not uh, Radio of uh, Liberty in, 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 in 1970. There is no Iron Curtain. So it's with the social media and the internet, it's, it's, everything is, is um, much, much easier. Uh, speaking of the second thing about, uh, about the situation with the visas and everything, well, we, we, it's always hard to talk about it because it's, it's like we're complaining uh, during all this terrible situation our government is doing in Ukraine, and it's it's uh, it's hard to <laughs> it's it's hard to to talk about it because on the one hand I, I perfectly understand what is happening and I understand why it is happening. On the other hand, I don't understand why this is happening. Okay, I have a red passport. I'm a Russian citizen, but I um, I did not. I, did, I never supported this war. I was always against it. And during all my life, I've been working as an independent journalist, trying to not to make this 
war happen. And uh, I think that uh, European uh, governments, uh, especially uh, Eastern European governments, should should try not to should should understand that there are Russians and there are Russians. There are those who are actually responsible for this terrible war, and there are those who who are trying to do something, and they are allies. After the war, we can sit together and, and talk about common responsibility, about why this all happened, but now we have other other goals, and I think that we have common goal, and we have to work together, because now sometimes it's, and as, as long as, as I understand, your journalists are experiencing the same, same problems for the Russian journalists, even if they work for Radio Free Liberty, funded by U US Congress, or even if they work for an independent TV station, they are being considered just like your Russians. So, for example, in Latvia, they banned all the Russian citizens from working visas, all. No matter who you are, where you work, just just all. So, and it's it's really complicated. But but again, what is uh, important to underline: it is nothing if you compare it to the situation in Ukraine with the journalists and with the citizens of this country. A tough situation, but war changes changes the rules and changes the way people think and feel. Jamie, talk a little bit about you've got how many countries are you operating in? Uh, yeah. We have we cover 23 countries and we have about 20 offices and. <clears throat> the biggest challenge we've had in the last several years is just how to stay in country. Uh, it used to be even in some of the toughest environments that authoritarians at least wanted to act like they supported media freedom. So they would allow a bureau to remain open. They might put in place regulations to make it difficult for people to do real reporting. But they still were willing to accept the physical presence of journalists. But the scary thing for me has been how quickly uh, most authoritarians are now discarding that playbook and heading directly towards what Putin has now achieved in Russia, or even worse, as I mentioned, what Lukashenko has achieved in, in Belarus, where it's the complete criminalization of journalism. So we've had to uh, leave Belarus in recent years. We actually had our, our bureau there physically raided by the Belarusian security services, uh, inviting Russia Today's journalists along for the show uh, to film uh, as they blew up our door and raided and trashed the office. Uh, we've had to shut down our bureau in Kabul, Afghanistan, uh, there, given the, the Taliban's threats against journalists. Uh, and then we've had this slow process, which really, for us, is a culmination of several decades of Vladimir Putin targeting us and our journalists, where we've had to close our bureau in Moscow. We still are operating in, in limited ways on the ground in Russia, uh, but we're facing the same challenges of how, how do you provide relevant reporting when you are outside of the country that you're trying to reach. Um, we're doing the same things of, of using technology, uh, using some sources on the ground that can be verified then if they share information with editors on the outside. But this is a, a significant challenge everywhere across Eurasia. Um, the other thing I'll just note, uh, we have about 350 journalists here in Prague at our headquarters from all of the countries that we operate in. And even journalists here inside the EU are being targeted by some of these regimes uh, and physical threats, harassment, their families, you know, even someone in Iran uh, who is a family member of an Iranian who works for Radio Free Europe here can be sure that you're going to be targeted by the intelligence services. Just several weeks and ago. And how does that manifest itself? In all kinds of extreme ways. Several weeks ago, we lost one of our Iranian journalists here uh, who died due to cancer. 45 years old, uh, his body was being sent back to Iran, and his body was grabbed by the IRGC, and they refused to give his family his body. So even in death, regimes are trying to target journalists and truth-tellers. Um, that's obviously an extreme version of it. We have two of our journalists still in prison in Belarus, actually detained uh, as we were getting designated an extremist. So the pressure is extreme across every part of our coverage region. And the, on the visa issue, I'd just say, I'd say it's even broader than the Russian challenge. The Russian challenge is unique right now because of the stance the EU has taken. But as someone who has spent countless hours trying to negotiate homes for Afghan journalists, there's a broader problem uh, with a lot of the immigration rules where I don't think most governments have created special classes for journalists and independent media, uh, because this is one of the most significant issues that we're facing how, where can people work safely? 
How can they still be close to the, the country that they're from, uh, tied into those diaspora networks, um, but they can be sure that they're not going to be harassed, that they're going to have not have to worry about their visa being renewed every three or six months. Uh, it's a significant challenge for us across our, our coverage region. We're spending a lot of time working with governments to try to address that. And the, the, where in the countries where you have sh shut down, like in Belarus, um, Afghanistan, uh, you said you have two, Bielo uh, uh, two journalists in Belarus who are in jail. The others, did you bring them out? And where and are you are you taking care of them? Are they living yeah. here or how so does we're that adopting work? a similar approach uh, to TV rain and others. We're setting up new hubs. Um, some of our colleagues are able to come here to Prague and work from headquarters. Uh, but we've also set up new reporting hubs uh, for each of the bureaus that we've had to close. Uh, we have a new office uh, that's been established in Vilnius, which we're, uh, we've placed a lot of our colleagues from Minsk at. And so they're serving Belarusian audiences from Lithuania. Uh, and we have a large Russia hub that we're establishing in Riga, uh, where uh, a lot of our Russia programming will be done from, in addition to a number of other locations like Tbilisi and Prague. Uh, but a lot of that has taken significant negotiations, working with governments. Uh, obviously, moving people and families is incredibly difficult, but it's something that is incredibly important to make sure that journalists can focus on their work and not have to worry about having a safe place to live or whether where their kids are going to go to school. Uh, and, and that's been a major challenge for us uh, over the last several years. Brigitte, we, you're not facing a situation of reporters in jail, but you certainly are in terms of um, harassment. Yes, but what I want to emphasize uh, while listening uh, what Jamie is reporting on and taken before, our challenges in Poland, you know, looks look like tiny, but still um, politicians are trying to undermine our credibility, not answering our questions. We've got uh, access to public information, constitutionally approved, um, granted, uh, reduced, yes. So, um, and all this stuff uh, connected with, um, with money also and advertising. Uh, when I'm listening to, uh, to it, what you already said, I'm thinking how how beautiful and crucial profession we have, you know. It's amazing. Because it's it's in Poland, in Czech Republic, and uh, Russia, Ukraine now, every single place in the world, Jamie was men mentioning, uh, how crucial it is that uh, authoritarian politicians are targeting it, us, our families, uh, to such extent. And um, coming back to your question, of course, it's not pleasant, you know. I, I've been working here for 21 years. I, I don't remember such thing as not, not allowing us to enter somewhere to su such meeting or press conference or even don't allow us to uh, enter a place where other media outlets can go easily. It's not pleasant. But um, I think that... Uh, what, what is our answer and what may be and what should be our answer to it? We should just be stronger and stronger in our standards and practices and uh, do what we should do. I, mean, I, I always had this thought of Timothy Snyder in my head just somewhere uh, that even or especially in these exceptional times, no matter how we define these times um, in Czech Republic, Poland, Belarus, Russia, Ukraine, or Iran, um, we should, we need to adhere to given standards because someday it ends. I mean, we, uh, we just stay with our journalism. And uh, some of our viewers say you should be as they are, I mean, state TV, state propaganda. And the answer cannot be different. Uh, we cannot be so. Maybe, uh, maybe that would be a way to fight, you know, to fight with the government. But this tension is something natural. I mean, we understand we are to control them. So I don't know any politician who likes journalists, you know. But... Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and it's okay. That's okay. I don't mind. <laughs> yes, I don't, but, but, but I would like them to let us do what we should do. Yes, um, and yeah, uh, you know, I don't want to regret because I heard what I heard. You know, it's it would be. Yes, 
I think it's nothing. Um, but of course, we would like to uh, have our constitutional right protected and uh, introduce for our politicians uh, in Poland. But uh, we, we have what we have, and we need to uh, find ourselves in that uh, circumstances. Um, Martin, um, in coming to you, and, and we're going to come to your questions in just a minute, I want to I sort of segue as a last round of brief uh, comments before we go to questions. Um, what, what, what would help? What, other than sitting in a room here, talking to each other, <laughs> um, and being inspired by each other, wh what is needed? What is it, uh, is it, do we need to hear from governments? Do we need to hear from corporate leaders? Do we need to hear from uh, civil society? What, how do we move towards a place of greater independent media pluralism? I know this is an impossible question, which is why I'm asking it, because I certainly don't know the answer. And neither do I. It's, a, it's such a complex question. I've been asking this question on the EBU level very often. You know, what, what can the EBU do? What, what reporters without borders, what can they do? Um, we in public service media don't tend to brag about our work, okay? It is not in our nature. We, you know, when we're facing attacks, we often say, you know, we'll just shrug it off, we'll just shake it off. It's, it's, it's okay, it's part of the job. Well, somewhere in you, it accumulates, right? I have received death threats as well, just because I do presenting. And it's not from state authorities like in Russia, but it comes from, from audience. It comes from supporters of various populist uh, politicians and parties in, in the Czech Republic. And what I do, I delete the message. And that's it. I go on my, you know, and move with, with move on with my business. But somewhere in you, it, it it kind of it picks up, and eventually it it can backfire. Um, the answer is we just got to do our work. We just have to concentrate on on truth and on on you know sincere reporting, and doing our work as independently as possible. Uh, I don't think there is any other answer than us doing the job that we are required to do and that we're paid for and that the, the law in the case of the Czech TV stipulates. Um, truth, nothing but the truth. But you're saying it may not be enough in, in cases. I, I totally get that, but that's what it is. Just let me add something and invest in fact-checking platforms. I mean, fighting with disinformation and misinformation because, you know, uh, I, I bet it's the same in Czech Republic and any other countries. And politicians are, are selling plenty of lies, yes, because they are struggling their, you know, um, uh, electoral success. So we are expanding our fact-checking platform and multiplying these efforts to s adhere the standards and mentioned before. We are the first uh, media outlet in Poland to have executive editor of standards and practices as American uh, news outlets uh, have. And I think that's the way, yes. And the other thing is what you mentioned. Sometimes we think it's okay, we got some threats, our colleagues did, um, but it's somewhere deep inside, you know, and some people just quit, just give up, just change their profession, and um, coming back to, to this being fragile, this freedom uh, of speech fragile, and media outlets, independent ones being fragile, we cannot, I even don't name it like this, because it, 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 it harms in, in, in a way. So we cannot be fragile, uh, even though um, governments uh, would love to see us. So. Yep. <laughs> sorry, sorry, just one thing. Um, in COVID, we realized, we meaning uh, European public service media, we realized that there is common practice, there is good practice that needs to be shared and we have these, and since then we have had these Friday meetings uh, every other Friday in the afternoon. It's something that we are most of us agreed on that we're most looking forward to out of the whole week. We have a meeting where we exchange ideas and we, we exchange information and we mutually support each other. There is BBC. There is uh, um, uh, there is uh, the Baltics TV have their presence there as well. Uh, there's German TV, ARD, ZDF. There is French and. And by this, sticking together, we learn from each other a lot. And at the COVID times at the beginning where we had to split newsrooms and so on, uh, it was a mutual assurance and it helps a lot. There is European projects that public service media concentrate on as well. 
concrete you know, project that online, for example, is called European Perspective. Online, where um, us in, in the Czech Republic can read in Czech what um, Austrian TV, Polish TV, um, the French TV, Spanish TV have on their websites with the help of artificial intelligence. And you can see quite easily you know, what other, people's, other countries are going through and, and concentrate on. It is something that holds us together, and you know, we should do as much as we can to stick together. So it, do you want to add, uh, either of you want to add? Okay, yeah. Go ahead, Jim. I, I just say, I mean, we talked already about governments providing a safe haven. Um, I always believe governments me, need to speak out more forcefully when journalists come under attack. Um, the, the, the current Czech government has been fantastic in that regard. I know they're, they've been playing a leading role in the Media Freedom Coalition. We notice is, it's not going affect, to affect Vladimir Putin or Lukashenko, um, but in places like Central Asia where we operate, these governments do care about that criticism, and we do see them respond. Um, that's one thing. Social media platforms, which were hinted at earlier uh, several times, actually, huge role uh, in, in all of this. We're on the broadcast panel, but um, we're a multimedia news organization. Digital is where our audiences are going. We have very little control over that way that we actually engage with those audiences. It's all in the algorithms. Uh, I always say during the Cold War, we owned and could m maneuver our transmitters. Uh, and we could circumvent jamming very easily uh, by just physically changing the way that our transmitters operated. We have, it's much more difficult now. We can use VPNs and other tools, but a lot of that control has been taken away from us, and it's residing uh, with people who are being driven by market dynamics, not really in the public interest. And so I think there's a whole conversation there about uh, potential regulation and more engagement uh, with the companies. And then finally, I completely agree on transparency. We see this as well. We need to educate new generations about why journalism is important. Uh, and in a lot of our markets, that tradition of journalism has ju is dying. Uh, journalism schools don't exist. People are not going into journalism because why would you want to? Uh, and the audiences also don't understand the role that journalists play. They think that if someone just posted something on Facebook about something they saw on the street, that has the same yeah. Yeah, yeah. standard yeah. as something that's deeply researched and reported. And so we're being even more transparent about our standards process, putting our standards editor out there to talk more about how we make decisions, engaging in conversations with our audiences uh, about how we make decisions about what to highlight in our reporting. And I think the more news organizations that uh, can do that, uh, the more likely that we can convince audiences that there is a role for journalism going forward. That's what we learned from our, our American friends, and we, now we are trying to uh, cooperate with our local friends in Poland because they are for, under huge pressure, and apart from financial help they need, for, for example, you know, law, lawyers. Uh, so we are trying also oh, on them. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. so this crucial meetings. And referring to what Jamie said, and the more government attacks us, the more we need to explain people why do we act that way. Why do they cover some stories, and why uh, state TV do not? And what's the you know the question why is I, I find it crucial because people sometimes do not understand why do we do this and why do we do it that way. And um, but ratings are okay, so I'm <laughs> I, I'm <laughs> so optimistic. Yeah. So transparency, collaboration, hearing solidarity, yeah, solidarity, hearing from. Um, from state leaders in countries where that will happen, speaking out more. Uh, social media regulation, I'm, I fear we're about to lose the only uh, public, uh, live public news plat social media platform out there in Twitter is, seems to be um, circling the drain. Um, so let us now uh, go to, with our just remaining minutes, uh, questions from the audience. I have a couple online, but I'd love to start in the room. Okay, yes, please. If you could stay, oh, uh, okay. Thank you very much for, for this panel. I mean, it's, it's, yes. My name is Adriana Dergam. I'm from uh, Prague Center for Media Skills, which is an NGO uh, uh, focused on, on media upskilling and education. My question would be for uh, Tichon Ziatko. In what extent, because we spoke about collaboration, in what extent uh, you and other, I would say, opposition or exiled Russian media as uh, Media Zona or uh, Echo or uh, Medusa uh, are collaborating together, sharing best practices in terms, for example, of monetization, cybersecurity, this kind 
like even like what how, how people's management and uh, if you coordinate about I would say uh, it, it might sound badly but dividing markets you mentioned one important thing which is broadcasting the Russian point of view the op opposition Russian point of view in English but for example I miss uh, this in Spanish which we are talking about Latin America 600 million people or or Spanish speaking population in the US so uh, is there a kind of alignment coordination uh, among you thank you well I would say that uh, unfortunately it has to Vladimir put the war so that's finally Russian independent media start to collaborate because before it was a crazy competition all all, all the time but now uh, well first time the collaboration was after the law on uh, so-called foreign agents when for example we made a marathon with all all the all, all the biggest independent media in Russia and uh, then now after after the beginning of the war of course we share information between ourselves we are absolutely before it was hard to imagine that we would i don't know post on post on telegram the link for the article of media zone or something because why would we now of course it's we 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 do it they do it we share information we share um we 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 collaborate in 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 um Admis uh, administrative questions such as visas and everything. So, again, for for the first, not first, but for the second time in in our history, we are now working together, which is amazing. Unfortunately, it it happened on such tragic and terrible period of time, but it happened. Hi, thank you. I'm Chloe from Reporters Without Borders, and it's more a comment than a question, but I just wanted to say that um, Reporters Without Borders has launched a, a tool and a weapon, which is called the Journalism Trust Initiative. Uh, TV Rain is, um, is certified, um, and it helps to show the transparency and the editorial process, so that can help to educate potentially the audience, um, help to raise um, subsidiaries, and also the... <coughs> sorry. The long-term goal um, is to get um, a better ranking and differentiate the content on the platforms. So I would be happy to discuss a journalism trust initiative with you. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you for that, and I'm glad you I'm glad you stood up because I knew you were here somewhere, but we hadn't met. So I wanted to introduce our uh, our, our friend from from RSF. Um, thank you for that. Yeah, and the journalism trust initiative is one of several sort of validation. Platforms. This is a this is an, an an excellent development. I think we have another question over here. Sorry, he's, yeah, uh, she's coming with the mic. Sorry, and then we'll do a question on the. Yeah, yes, yes, you're next. You're yeah. Oh, shall sure. I, if, okay. Shall I stand? If you would like, it's up to you. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Pietro Andrea Poda from the platform. At first, thank you very much for allowing me uh, to be here. Mine is more a reaction to what has been said by Mr. Dvorak, correct? Uh, Mr. Dvorak, if I have understood correctly, you have uh, more or less... He's actually not here, but you can go ahead. Yeah, he had, he had to leave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, <laughs> sorry, I have confused the person. Uh, but it doesn't matter, because uh, what I have understood uh, is this, that... Uh, <clears throat> It has been said that uh, uh, at the time of the government of Mr. Babish, uh, journalists were often attacked uh, or eventually insulted by the government and its members. And in any case, the, uh, the conflict of interest of Mr. Babish as uh, prime minister, as well as the uh, owner of media, was something, a matter of concern. Is this what has been said? Do I understand correctly? If so, uh, I have the impression as a Westerner that uh, of course, uh, and maybe I'm going out of the scope of the conference, but uh, I have the impression that uh, the, you West form this as a question, the Western have. media are uh, often against uh, whoever in politics doesn't really respect what can be labeled as political correctness. So I see this with Mr. Babish. I see this with Mr. Berlusconi when he was the Prime Minister of Italy and with the current Italian uh, persons in the government, with Trump as well. 
a bit of a bias, that's my impression at least, against whatever these people do and say, as long as they are not sticking to what is the mainstream political correct uh, version of the facts. And then these people react. So can it be that uh, also politicians in power as the right to react and eventually to criticize those who criticize them? This would be my question. Thank you. Who would like to take that one? <laughs> um, yes, they have every right to criticize media, of course. But we have every right to hold them accountable. And it's very often the populist politicians, they don't know and they don't, they don't get the notion that they should be held accountable. They think that they are, um, they, very often they own media, so they think that they're not criticizable. Uh, they often think that their truth is the only truth in the world, and when we expose something different, when we ask them questions, they, they you know, say, no, this is fake news. I've been to Donald Trump, I covered Donald Trump uh, campaign in 2016, um, and others in, in the United States uh, on, on various occasions. And once we were standing on the media riser at the back of the conference room, um, there were his supporters in the middle and Mr. Trump on the riser on the stage uh, in front. For the first time in my life, it happened that Mr. Trump was speaking and saying, you know, turn around, look at the fake media behind you. And everyone kept staring at us. We were never the object of, of any attention here. We were there, you know, public eye covering what was going on. We should have not been the the, the subject of attention of, of Mr. Trump. And everyone you know, started showing their uh, middle fingers at us and, and shouting at us and so on. And this is not what you know, I think the, the politicians versus media relations should look like. We should criticize them, they can criticize us, it's fine, but this leads to attacks. This leads to the complete um, lack of, of decency in the relationship. And we, just, we should be tough, they should be tough, but this is beyond that. Just very quickly, in Poland we had actually challenges with every single government before, also the liberal ones. But, um, and we had some cases, you know, and uh, much of tension. But never before, this, for example, this access to public information uh, has been so restricted, yes. Or we are not invited to some press conferences, or no one before called us publicly betrayers. Or, uh, you know, when we work together uh, in the name of public interest, yes, um, um, we can criticize ourselves. It's, it's about democracy, yes, it's about it. But uh, there is a very, very uh, tiny uh, line uh, where uh, you can just be on the other side when you uh, when you withdraw, the, um, withdraw my mandate as a journalist to uh, cover stories, you know, because, because that's my job. And um, when, when politicians want to shut some media outlets down because it's not uh, convenient, it's too much, yes. We're going to come over here to you for the last uh, question in the room, but while the mic is going over, and that's okay, you can wait there. I'm going to take a question online. Um, so thank you for those of us who, those of you who have stuck with us um, online and upvoted the questions. Um, I love this question because in the context of it, somebody is still at, in the context of everything we're talking about, somebody is still asking, which I love, how to inspire young journalists to get internships and start careers in your organizations. Um, so uh, just the notion that all of this is inspiring people to want to go into journalism is a wonderful thing. What, just briefly, who would like to just address uh, uh, how we, uh, how we encourage, I'm going to rephrase a little bit rather than how do they apply for internships. They can probably figure that out online. Uh, but rather, um, what do we need to do to inspire young people uh, for careers in journalism? We want to hear is anybody on this uh, at this side of the panel <laughs> wants to address that. Well, I think that even in uh, such um, even in such country in Russia where it feels that journalism doesn't change anything, that's not true. Journalism 
changed a lot. For example, we understand now that uh, for our viewers in Russia, it's those who watch TV Rain, of course, they are against the war because because they, they would not watch TV Rain if they were supporting the war. Uh, and in Russia now, it feels that everyone is supporting the war because propaganda is everywhere. And for the people it's who are against the war, it's really important to understand that they are not alone. And uh, part of our job work now is to show to them, to our viewers, that, guys, you are not alone. There are, I don't know, 13, 14 million people just like you. And uh, we we received a lot of feedback from, from the viewers how important it is for them to see... I don't know, for example, on a chat you know, on, YouTube, on a YouTube stream, see messages from people from St. Petersburg, from Samara, from Vladivostok, from all over the country, and to feel that there are a lot of people just like them. This is one of the like, reasons for being a journalist now in, in Russia. Thank you. That's a perfect answer. Okay, last question, hopefully a brief one and a brief answer, because we're, I'm holding you all up on your break. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Tomáš Bouška. I'm uh, representing Novinarsky Incubator, the journalism incubator and NGO based here in um, the Czech Republic. I'd like to thank um, the Aspen family for holding this event and especially this wonderful panel, the morning panel. I have a little question here. How naive is it, according to you, to ask for establishing a sustainable platform for the training of future uh, journalists, your colleagues, who could uh, strengthen you know, the front line of free press. Because as we hear, and I'm sure we will hear some more about this, the free press is at stake. It will go on like this. And if there's one thing that is sure, I guess, it is that this is strongly demotivating for young future journalists, leaders in the free media. So I wonder, there's many other NGOs that I can see here in the auditory who try to provide some education, support, you know, carry a push to the emerging um, independent journalists. Your question is how, what, what needs to happen in order yeah. to create such a platform? If there is a way or if this is just a too naive question. Thank you so much. I would just say I'm, I'm all for more engagement on training for journalists. We benefit from the work of many of the NGOs here in the room. We've had a lot of conversations with our European uh, public broadcasting counterparts, Deutsche Welle, BBC, about this, because it also gets to how we can convince audiences that we're still relevant if we are doing our work in the most professional manner. We have a num I should also mention we have a number of fellowship programs. People can check out our website, both here in Prague as well as in our bureaus. And what I've seen that you need to do to convince people to go into journalism, they need to be convinced that there's a future career for them, that there are jobs for them. And the problem in many of the countries we operate in is when you have only oligarch uh, business models, why would a truthful journalist, an independent journalist, decide they want to pursue that as a career? If there's really only one real news organization that they can work for, uh, it's much better to go be a lawyer or a doctor or something that you know is sustainable over decades. And so I think if we want to inspire people to go into journalism in many of these countries, we need to first tackle those broader problems with the media landscapes. And we need more media diversity in those markets. And so we're, we're trying to do our small, small part with our fellowships, but that's where the donors and others, I think, need to get involved and, and make sure that there are viable long-term employment opportunities for people once they choose journalism. Thank you, Jamie. And I think maybe we can talk more about the, the platform idea uh, for training journalists um, over the break. Okay, so we're now going to go to break. I really want to thank our panelists. This was a fantastic panel for sharing your experiences and especially for the work you do. Thank you so much. I'm equally uh, as excited uh, for this conversation as I was for the last one. We're now going to be focusing on print and digital news media. I mean, there were different ways we could divide this up, but this seemed, um, I think there are television and broadcast uh, news entities have, have certain things in common, and so do sort of print and digital, which are, are, are different, but, you know, a lot of digital stems out of, out of print. And so um, we've got uh, five amazing um, 
journalists here um, who I am now going to introduce. So um, all the way um, at the end is uh, Matush Kastolny. He is the editor-in-chief and one of the founders of the independent journal Denik N. Am I pronouncing it correctly? Okay, in Slovakia. Um, for 20 years, and I'm sure we'll hear more about this, um, he was with SME. Um, the last eight years of those 20 as editor-in-chief. And I'm sure we'll hear more about uh, why you left SME and, and, um, and created uh, Denik N. Um, next, we have um, uh, Sevgil Musayeva. She is the editor-in-chief of Ukrainska Pravda, um, a journalist since she was a young girl living in the Crimea. Um, Ukrainska Pravda, which you created. You didn't create. Okay. <laughs> Okay, okay, all right. So, uh, but you were your editor in chief nonetheless, which is up to f for eight years, four million people uh, reporting on everything from the war crimes to, uh, to U Ukrainian civilian heroes. And um, I particularly love published an exclusive list of oligarchs, yachts, and planes around the world. Um, next, we have um, <coughs> Andrea. Uh, Proshkovska. Oh, did I get it? Yeah, you got the oh, <laughs> no. Prachavskova. Prachavskova, okay. Uh, Deputy Editor-in-Chief of Respect uh, here in the Czech Republic. She's the founder of Nazavarani, uh, which means opinionated. I messed that up too, I'm sure. Which is, a <laughs> which is a non-profit project arranging discussions for young people about the political situation and issues like climate change, fake news, and education. And we're going to talk about fake news. Um, next, we have uh, Natalia Antalava, co-founder and editor-in-chief of the award-winning media startup Coda Story, um, which is based in the United States and also in Tbilisi, Georgia, where um, Natalia lives. Uh, prior to that, she was many years with the BBC, working in the Caucasus, Central Asia, uh, Middle East, DC, Washington, D.C., India, um, and has won many awards, including an Emmy nomination. And then um, finally, um, Martin Karpati, CEO and founder of Telex HU, which is Hungary's largest community-funded news service online. Uh, Martin was previously editor-in-chief of Index HU um, and held a variety of other roles in journalism. And uh, just like Matush, I'm sure we're going to hear about your uh, exit from, um, from Index to create um, uh, uh, Telex. Okay. Um, so actually, Martin, I'm going to start with you um, because uh, you are in, in Hungary, which, as we know, uh, has a difficult uh, press environment. So just like if you were here for the other panel, I just want to start by having um, each of the panelists just talk, talk a little bit about your news organization and the context of the news media environment in your country, and then we can get into more in-depth issues a, a little bit later on in the conversation. Okay. Hello, everyone, and thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to uh, bringing us here. Uh, well, uh, in the panel, in the previous panel, we heard that uh, Poland is uh, something like the 60th uh, place on the uh, World Press Freedom Index. The Czech Republic is, uh, if I remember right, is the uh, 20th. Uh, Hungary is the 92nd. Um, so we have, uh, we have uh, big problems. Uh, in 2006, we were the 10th. So uh, it's a deep uh, decline. Um, we have... Um, we have a, a complex and tough situation in Hungary. Uh, there are several parts uh, uh, um, dysfunctioning. Uh, the uh, um, public service media uh, is owned by, uh, by or um, is managed by the uh, pro-government um, uh, forces. Uh, all the, there are more than 50 uh, news outlets uh, gathered into one company. Uh, they, they all uh, uh, serve pro-government uh, um, um, lines, and, uh, and, uh, and it's really hard to, to 
reach uh, people outside of Budapest with, with real and independent uh, uh, news. Um, I, you want me to talk about the Hungarian landscape more? Uh, sure. Yeah. So uh, this is how we 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 look like. We we the there's another problem: the advertisement market. The biggest advertiser in in Hungary is the state. The these uh, money spent on advertisement in Hungary from the state don't go to independent independent uh, uh, sites. They only go to pro-government sites, which distorts the market very much. Um, as an independent journalist, there are a few of us. Uh, it's really hard to. Uh, the biggest problem is is accessing in information, and this is nothing <coughs> compared to the uh, problems we heard from the uh, Russian colleague in the previous panel, or what we're gonna hear from the Ukrainian uh, colleague uh, later on. <coughs> but uh, yet it. It's still a problem. Uh, we we don't get uh, invitations to press conferences. We don't get answers from from uh, uh, state-owned uh, um, uh, organizations. Uh, we we can hardly talk to uh, pro-government politicians. We have to chase them on the streets with camera, and yet, yet we still don't get uh, answers. So it's um, it's. Uh, it's a it's a tough situation, and I I I, um, I used to work as a journalist for for more than 25 years, and and uh, uh, I I have never thought that it's going to be this hard to work as a journalist in the let's say in the middle or uh, or the east part of Europe um, uh, in 2022, but it's it's getting worse and worse, and uh, and um, we have to. Keep fighting. Thank you. I have more questions for you, but we'll, okay. we'll we'll come back to that um, uh, in a little in a little bit. Um, I'm going to jump around a little bit. So, um, uh, Sev, I'd like to come to you. Talk to us uh, a little bit about Ukrainska Pravda and um, and what talk a little bit to us about operating uh, and reporting um, out of Ukraine today. Oh, thank you for this question. So, Ukrainska Pravda is leading newspaper in our country, and um, for the first uh, months, of, months of war, we had around, um, first days, actually, around 7 million readers, um, then 4 million um, for maybe 6 months, and now it's around 2, because people, uh, I think that they're tired about uh, Ukrainian news and about uh, like grief and uh, Everything you receive uh, in, in on the daily basis for the last uh, nine months already. Uh, so uh, how is changed? It's changed dramatically. So because before war we focused more on political issues, on domestic issues. We covered corruption. We covered reforms. We covered anti-corruption strategy. Now 90% of our coverage uh, on the front line and war, of course. Uh, we have our reporters working from uh, war. War um, like from front lines from different cities. Um, we have our sources in occupied territories by Russia. Uh, so, and only 10% maybe about political issues, uh, corruption, and investigations. And uh, even uh, such news some irritates some readers because they think it's not time uh, to publish like uh, controversial or maybe uh, thing that um, can ruin, for example, the support of Ukraine. Uh, so, and about about our um, work during last uh, nine months, uh, so I think that I feel myself as Robinson Crusoe, <laughs> um, in, and uh, you face with uh, new incredible challenges every single day. Uh, and it's all about like financial pressure, it's about um, emotional pressure, uh, it's about, uh, of course, relocation of the team to um, safe places. Then um, last three weeks, we have another one challenge. It's about electricity and the internet. So you in, sometimes you have a challenge just to produce the news. I remember I left Kiev on Wednesday evening and on Wednesday morning, I was trying to um, 
uh, join um, Starlink to the generator. <laughs> and I think that it's also about uh, Ukrainian reality now when you're <laughs> trying to join, um, uh, to connect uh, Starlink uh, with a generator uh, that works on fuel. And I think that like two realities uh, meet in, in Ukraine now. Uh, so, but uh, still um, our people and our team, um, of course, people are really exhausted emotionally, um, but they want um, to work. They have uh, this passion um, because it's uh, the battle for our country, just to, the right to, uh, to our country to exist. Uh, and uh, about my emotional pressure, I want just to show you a, not a picture, just a, a current situation of a newsroom, because two of our colleagues, for example, they decided to, to join army. They went to the front line as a soldiers, and with, um, um, they explained me that in such situation, it, it, it was the right choice because you have this conflict between your citizen or your journalist every single time, and when you understood that maybe you will be. Um, but a soldier, you join army. So, and he was uh, like, he's a brilliant. For example, last one he left um, around two months ago. He's a brilliant videographer. Uh, he made wonderful uh, stories from different parts of our country. But then he said, "Okay, um, I have only one country, and I don't want uh, that Russia will come." And so, uh, then three of our colleagues uh, already. Um, mm, like three, three colleagues, um, our uh, literally relatives died um, in different circumstances. So one, my colleague, uh, then uh, the soldier, the, the, the father of my uh, colleague uh, that's responsible, for example, for English version, he died as a soldier. And uh, the father died as, as a civilian. He was killed by Russian soldier in Bucha in the beginning of, of war. Uh, still five uh, colleagues, uh, they have their relatives uh, that live in occupied territories, and it's also uh, about emotionality of this war, So, because you, you think about them every single moment. And uh, two left the country because they won't take care about uh, your kids. It's, in, it's all about like terrible choices uh, you face every single day. And I want to mention that already um, in this war we lost eight journalists who were killed in lines of duty, and 36 journalists who just decided to go to the army and, um, and fight, so. Thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that. Many more questions for you um, to come. Um, I want to um, next, um, um, Natalia, uh, go to you. If you could talk a little bit about um, Coda story and particularly the context. I realize you also operate in the United States. We could talk about that at another time. Uh, oh. <laughs> but to talk about the context of what your experience in, in Georgia. Yeah, sure. Uh, sorry, I was just consumed by the what Sevgil said about Ukraine being all about terrible choices. Um, so Coda, uh, Coda is a thematic newsroom, and we cover roots of global crisis. Uh, so we don't operate in any specific country. Most of our audience is in the U.S., um, but um, and part of the editorial team is in the U.S. Uh, but we really try to figure out the patterns and how, you know, how um, how things are connected, how the, the context to the news. And we didn't set out one of our main themes is disinformation, but we didn't set out to cover this information in the beginning. We very much wanted to create, you know, I left the BBC because I wanted to create um, a newsroom that really focused on context and continuity. And actually one of the, mm, one of the kind of in, in the very beginning of um, setting up Coda, I remember uh, when we were brainstorming with lots of people, the concept and how we would actually do it. It was during the mm, first invasion of Ukraine in 2014, 2015. And um, someone called me and said, listen, I'm, I'm watching Ukraine on the news and can you explain to me what's going on? And that's very much what we were inspiring to do is kind of like create that context. And since then, you know, disinformation came out, uh, coverage of disinformation came out of our, our uh, first project, which focused on LGBTQ in, in Russia. And we looked at it not... You know, we try to understand how that rhetoric, the anti, the homophobic 
how Putin turned homophobia into a weapon um, uh, that he deployed globally, right, from the United States and the, uh, his links to the far-right groups and evangelicals to Eastern Europe and Central Asia and everywhere else. And um, the disinformation was all always all about the hatred for the West and the same thing that drives so much of the war that we are seeing in Ukraine. And since that first, you know, the beginning of CODA, since that coverage, we've basically seen these patterns emerge and spread all around the world. And we were talking yesterday about how, you know, I've often been impressed tracking, tracking this. I've often been impressed by how well the authoritarians collaborate, how um, well run are these slightly ad hoc uh, networks that they create, how nimble and flexible they are, and how effective they have been in, in spreading the message. And Georgia, I think, is just a illustration of um, uh, the very much of a global pattern, but it's also, I think, a real warning to the rest of us, uh, to the rest of Eastern Europe. And um, Georgia obviously has always been in a much more fragile position because it wasn't, you know, part of NATO, part of the European Union, always an aspiring member. But literally two years ago, I remember sitting at um, a background briefing with someone very senior at NATO saying, you know, it's Georgia, it's going to be Georgia first. You know, Ukraine really doesn't have a chance. It's, you know, it's, it's Georgia that's going to be first. And the, just the deterioration of freedoms and the squeezing of the, uh, that space, um, that public space in which media can operate and be successful has been extraordinary. Just uh, this week, um, the head of one of the um, main opposition, the main opposition channel was sentenced to three and a half years in prison. Um, the, the channel will almost inevitably shut down because they don't have the money to continue broadcasting. Other uh, independent channels are facing the same. But this is in a country that was until about yesterday the beacon of democracy and like the most promising, um, uh, one of the most promising places in, in the region. So um, I, I think, you know, it uh, really underlines the urgency of, uh, of action, of doing something and creating you know, rethinking our approach and what it has been because it hasn't worked. Uh, we are backsliding and I think it hasn't worked for a whole number of reasons and maybe we'll go deeper into it. But, you know, I was listening to the previous panel and there was so much, you know, great stuff. And one of the things that Tihon said was, you know, at least we're not in the 1970s, like at least it's not the Iron Curtain. But I think, um, I wonder uh, more and more at times whether what we have today is actually worse because I think, you know, noise has become the new censorship. And for journalists to be getting through this noise is becoming more and more difficult. And unless we find a way of breaking through that wall of noise that is polarizing our societies and breaking journalism and democracy with it, um, we are in deep trouble. Thank you. And I, I want to come back to the role of the platforms and mis and disinformation and that noise you talk about. Um, it's an interesting perspective to say, is it worse than when, when there was access to no information? Um, uh, Matush, um, I wanted to uh, come, come to you next to talk about um, Slovakia. Thank you. Um, I mean, I feel strange to talk about Slovakia because compared to Ukraine, it's so stupid to talk about Slovakia and our problems. Uh, so I want to uh, tell how much I admire Ukrainians, our Ukrainian colleagues, and, and if it would be possible, I would love to support them as much as it would be possible. We're trying to do some kind of help. We have uh, some Ukrainian journalists working for us, uh, but it's still not enough, and it would be much better if it would be possible to, to do more. Uh, in Slovakia, I mean, we are a normal country uh, where there is no war, and that's it. So we have our problems. We have stupid politicians who attack us verbally, but we are not uh, dealing with problems with electricity or heating or whatever. So uh, we, mm, 
we're lucky to be in that position. And uh, uh, I feel free as a journalist in Slovakia, which is, again, no, not uh, uh, sure in other countries and uh, even compared to, to Hungary or Poland, uh, I feel free and, and that's very important. Our own project is a, is a proof that Slovakia is a, f a country where free media are possible to, to, to live and, and uh, I mean, yeah, eight years ago we started a, a new media uh, outlet because uh, oligarchs wanted to buy uh, our own, our old paper, and I didn't like it, and, and I didn't want to wor work for them. But it was so easy. <laughs> uh, if I look back to uh, to the, that year, that year, and uh, we were lucky to be successful, and which is probably kind of interesting even for uh, international audience. Uh, we were able to to start a, a subscription model, uh, which is profitable. And uh, we are, we are as a company, as a as a newspaper, we are profitable. Eighty percent of our incomes is coming from our readers, and it makes us really <coughs> be free and able to produce quality journalism, and that's the most important thing. And I'm ready to answer all the questions, but I mean, <laughs> what uh, before say? I just want to say, and I'm going to come, um, um, Andrea, come to you in a minute. I just wanted this to sorry, make a personal commentary. Of course, it's impossible for any of us to sit here and talk about our problems with um, Sev Gill sitting on the panel and, and what you're experiencing, and I completely understand that. But just to put some context, we're, and we're talking about backsliding press freedoms um, throughout, well, all over the world, frankly. And so I, I want us not to feel like um, we need to say there are no problems when there are problems and things are getting worse. And oligarchs buying major news organizations to control the message is a problem. So, sorry, I'm not trying to make you not be happy. I'm glad that you're happy and it's all great. But I just want to say that's the reason that we're talking about it. And as we go to Andrea, who's also going to say, uh, I, I, in, in case you're tempted to say, yes, everything is perfect uh, because we have power and water. I understand that. But nonetheless, talk to us a little bit about <laughs> Yeah, thank you for having me. I am also glad that Matush is happy uh, in Slovakia. <laughs> I think it's important because the uh, the Nigen is like great uh, news organization, and I think it like deserves all the support they have from readers. Uh, I would agree that it's hard to like make some comments about problems in the Czech, Czech media, but. Uh, but I try, but I try, uh, because I don't think that we like face some political pressure as much as like the other countries we are representing here. I think that also we have like the best results in freedom of press when we look at you know Freedom House and other other statistics. It doesn't it doesn't mean that it's like ideal situation, and I think that someone from the public media would say. Another thing, because they have much harder position than the private media when we are talking about conflicts with politicians. And I also also heard that you have some talk, that you heard uh, some talk about Czech media landscape, landscape. So I just say that Respect is weekly magazine. It's a combination of print, which is uh, still like core outlet for us or platform. And it's also a combination of uh, online uh, online platform. And it has like 30 years uh, tradition and it was founded after uh, 1989. And I would say that like the biggest challenge for the Czech private media is that we don't, we haven't found yet any like sustainable and profitable model of newspaper to like not be dependent on on owners or just just to have like this subscription model as uh, Matush was talking about. Uh, and it's because we don't have tradition of paying for news, like at all. Like it's very different situation in comparison with uh, Slovakia because we have a lot of free uh, media, of, media which are free of charge. Uh, we have really good public media who, who also operates, uh, who also operate in uh, online uh, space. 
And that's like much harder position for private media to figure out how to deal with this because and how to persuade readers to pay for news, which I I think that that it's like there is some quality to to pay for. Uh, and especially when we are talking about uh, current situation, it's like economic crisis. We have one of the biggest inflation, maybe still the biggest inflation in Europe. Uh, just for your information, our printing expenses just for this year uh, grew, grew up like uh, six million. Only this thing, so up, so we paying like for um, more than six million just for printing expense, uh, printing expenses, and also there there is also. Um, people are trying to save some money, so they they just don't want on couldn't pay for uh, private media, so as much as uh, in like the previous year. So uh, everybody in the Czech uh, private media falling down with these numbers. Uh, so it's not like we don't have like existential crisis as war or like really uh, bad press environment as in Hungary or Poland, but I think it's also um, also some challenge to like figure out because at the end we could end up with like really few media who have only like f um, open uh, open open information or just who are not like uh, founded by subscribers uh, and they have money from you know for example search and giant as like uh, our like biggest medium I think seznam dot uh, who 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 was who pays for uh, their news because they have like search engine as a Google and it's much more uh, used than Google in the Czech Republic. So, you know, I want to talk a little bit about um, um, business models and, and also tie that into something that you said a little bit earlier, Natalia, about all of the noise and, and mis- and disinformation. So the sustainability of news organizations is closely tied in with press freedom issues in terms of media plurality and available availability of news sources, particularly in countries where uh, the government is one of the largest advertisers and can choose where to advertise or not advertise. In addition to that, we now have a situation where over the last um, 10, 15 years, where the, the social media platforms are pulling out advertising because they can deliver advertising in a much more efficient way than on, on news sites. So that that leaves reader revenue as, for many, as the main source of revenue. So I wanna understand um, from you all, and I can call on you, or you can say, we could just kind of mix it up uh, a little bit. Just talk about um, both the, the, the impact of the platforms, not on your business model, but all are also, as you were saying, on your ability to reach audiences. What kind of impact does it have on your news organizations, on your ability to, to um, reach audiences and on your credibility. <laughs> um, so um, we have a special business model. I, I didn't talk about it uh, uh, um, um, before. Um, we used to work at uh, Hungary's biggest news site, which is called Index. And uh, uh, at one point, some uh, uh, government-linked oligarchs came onto the board of the company above the, uh, so into the publisher company of Index. And at one point, uh, they, they had some ideas and strategic uh, 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 ways um, uh, what we should do at Index, and they were just, uh, th that was a worrying sign. And at one point, uh, they fired our uh, editor-in-chief. So the entire staff uh, uh, of 90 people just quit in one day. We stood up and we said, OK, this was, this, this, this was the red line. We, we, we don't want to work in a way uh, how they want us to work. And uh, we decided to make uh, something new. Uh, th this is Telex. Telex is uh, two years old now. Um, uh, when we started, we, we had nothing. We, we didn't have uh, money for uh, um, 
laptops, we didn't have an office, we didn't have uh, mobile phones, we had literally nothing. So we asked uh, the readers that, okay, we are, we, we are the guys who, who made index, who, who uh, with what you like that much, and uh, we want to make something new, but we cannot do it without your support. So uh, we asked them uh, uh, to donate us, and uh, uh, for one month we did a pretty successful campaign uh, for, for uh, uh, getting some money to, to make a comfortable uh, and safe start uh, for Telex, and it happened. Uh, we had, uh, um, for the moment, I guess we are uh, having uh, five, uh, 50,000 50, 50, uh, donations altogether. Some of them are regular donators, and uh, most of them are, are uh, occasional donators. And um, this is one part of our uh, of our uh, uh, finances. The other part is advertisement revenue. Uh, which is uh, a bit complicated in Hungary, as I mentioned, because the biggest uh, spender is the state. The state uh, doesn't want to advertise in, in uh, places where, where uh, free voices can be heard. Uh, and there are some advertisers who are afraid to advertise um, on, 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 uh, on these kind of platforms because they are afraid that they, are get, they, are, they won't get any money from the state if they advertise <coughs> at places like, like ours. But yet we... Uh, we, we get some money from them, but uh, to to keep this up and uh, to to have the opportunity to develop and to make some progress, we need we need more and more funds. So we are uh, uh, growing the third legs uh, of, of ours, which would be like grants. Uh, uh, we see some changes in. Uh, uh, European and, and American um, um, budgets um, being op more open to think about how how they can have these kind of platforms. So this is uh, this is how we we work. Uh, your original question was how we can reach more audience. I really or? was asking a couple of different questions at once. So yeah. yeah. But, but, <laughs> uh, so um, as I. I just said this uh, uh, long monologue to 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 get on uh, to this uh, uh, answer. Um, we 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 are still a new uh, new site, two years old. We were in a rush for the last two years. We were we we just rushed, 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 and uh, now we have the time to to stop a bit, to slow not stop, <laughs> to, to to slow a bit and and rethink what we want to do, what our strategy uh, should be, and, um, um, and we are growing. It's a, it's a very difficult road uh, to, to, to build a new site and to grow uh, uh, um, audience, but uh, we are campaigning, we, we, we do our best, and the, the, the main thing is we, we have to make good content. I mean, good content. Uh, I'm sure Matush uh, will uh, agree, <laughs> I know, and I know their story. Uh, without good content, there's no chance to, to break the, the, the wall of noise. Uh, there's no chance to, to uh, build bigger audience. So, and, and good content needs good journalists, good journalists needs good salaries, <laughs> and so on and so on. But, uh, I, I want to ask you a quick follow-up question, uh, but I do want to come back in a minute to this. Is good quant content enough? I'm, I'm not so sure. But just a quick follow-up question in terms of your story. What happened to Index after you all quit? Well, uh, they are still running. Um, they just hired new, a whole bunch of new people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they hired new people. Uh, um, we don't know um, probably... Uh, none of them. I mean, they are not um, uh, well, uh, well uh, trained journalists or journalists from the field. We don't know them. We haven't met them at any press conferences. We, we, we just don't know who these people are. And they are still making Hungary's, uh, one of Hungary's biggest news sites still because, uh, because it's, uh, it's, uh, it was a, a very uh, old and uh, well-known brand. And um, and um, it's it's hard to change old habits. I mean, people used to wake up 
reading index, and they most of them uh, still still do that, but uh, um, they, they they don't get the same quality news as they did before. But they don't care; they still yeah. read it. Matish, is good content and is good content enough? Uh, I would say yes, but I mean, <laughs> this is the answer where you where you see that there there might be. Um, monkeys working as journalists, and it would be enough, probably. But you had uh, a similar story in terms no, of leaving. No, I it. mean, no. We left the the original paper, and uh, and the paper is still there, still alive, and uh, and survived the pressure from from oligarchs. The, the oligarchs already are gone. After five years or seven years, uh, they they pull out the out of the paper because uh, the paper was fighting against uh, against them. So it it was a kind of a happy end, a uh, lucky story, because at the end we have uh, two quality papers in Slovakia out of one, and... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I mean... We'll to Slovakia. <laughs> we were lucky, but... Uh, <clears throat> it is. It is. We are doing well. But, but uh, I don't know if quality journalism is enough. I mean, definitely not, because... Uh, you have to find ways how to tell to your people, how to tell the, to the audience that there is quality journalism there. So you have to find something uh, how to mm, how to spread it around. And, and I mean, when we started, we had a fantastic story, and uh, it was a news story in the country, and everybody everybody knew about it. It was a story where we were trying to say that there is. Uh, not everything is possible to buy for money, and and people understood it because the 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 oligarchs they were involved in so many businesses and even dirty businesses, uh, so it was not a not a normal average company. It was a company which was involved in corruption scandals in Slovakia. It was a company which was involved in in uh, really like managing the country actually because they were like uh, shadow government because they were able to, to run the country, run the politicians. So people knew about it and we were lucky to have this story behind us and that was the reason why people started to read our stories and they knew us from the the older, from the previous newspaper, they knew the story so we were lucky but still I thought it's very important to to have a good marketing, to have a good PR uh, but we didn't have uh, any agencies to do it for us and and I really didn't want it because it's uh, I don't think this is uh, good for journalism so we found a way how to promote our our journalism with it with itself our best promotion is uh, our uh, articles videos and discussions and books and magazines <laughs> and and we we were lucky to 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 tell it to to the audience they they found us i mean we will probably never be the biggest paper in the country uh we will probably never be the uh most read newspaper but uh we have our audience and it's uh it's big enough to to support uh, our newsroom it's big enough to support our journalists they after years, they are already uh, com the salaries are comparable to the salaries in the in the on the market. Uh, after years, we we don't have problem to to buy a second car for the for the uh, newsroom. We are not uh, we don't have problem to to hire new people. We started as 45 people. Now we are 120. Uh, we invest all the money we we receive from our reader. We, we invested into quality journalism. So we. I don't have a, uh, I don't have a special um, office. I'm sitting with my colleagues in, in this newsroom. I don't have a car or assistant or whatever. We don't have uh, PR people uh, working for the newspaper. We have only, only. It's out of those 120, 100 are working on content, and that's it. Andrea, I would like to follow uh, up to uh, what Matos said. Because I, I think that like 
good content is a very important part of like have readers and have money but uh it's also about like saying that you have like good good journalism and it's it's i think it's hard because we are respect is uh the biggest uh uh like weekly magazine in the Czech republic we have we have like 30 for each issue each issue uh by approximately um 35000 people in the Czech republic which is big number but also even for us like each hundred up to that is like really big deal because it's it depends on on every reader we have to to like have more money and there is really uh hard to persuade new people to come to uh respect or other uh, Czech media we have uh here and like when i said that i think that the good content is not enough is for my experience i did like one of my biggest investigation was like two or three years ago i wrote article about the fact that czech president and uh his people tr tried to influence uh court decisions uh, and it was like huge court, court, decisions. court yeah, decisions it was a huge story but it was the less selling less sold issue in like two or three years of uh, respect because a lot of media who are free of charge took this information and rewrote it rewrote it uh, in their articles and we, you know that's that's hard to figure this out because uh how to do like good journalism and also investigation when you don't have any money from this because it's so important that every other media uh write, uh, write about it and like also the the biggest number of newcomers to respect uh was after where after like the lost elections for example when uh, Zeman won uh, the presidential election or when Andrei Babish won uh, parliamentary election or when uh, some some politician uh, attacked or verb verbally attacked our colleague it's not about content uh, i i don't see i don't see any like um connection to the good content when you when you're talking about like rising uh huge numbers of readers to our sites it's i i don't think that our readers think it's not important but it's not the main cause in this line's clip Natalia, i think you're i have a feeling you're going to have a slightly different view on um as you could since you already expressed it about how you cut through. Yeah, uh, I think um, I, I, I also I'm a big believer in the power of storytelling. And I think, you know, one um, kind of partial answer to that, I think we often we as journalists often underestimate um, one, the, you know, superpower of journalism, which is our ability, like stories that delight. Like I think stories that delight manage to capture people's attention. And I think it's because getting through the noise means getting through the apathy, right? Getting through the fact that, well, yeah, we expect the oligarchs to be the assholes who steal all our money. Like, okay, Panama Papers, big investigation. And uh, not to this, incredible investigations, you know, incredible journalists that's done. But, you know, how much of it, there, there is such complacency and apathy in the societies because there's so much that is coming at them. You know, war uh, fatigue now is, is a real issue. Um, protest fatigue is a real issue. You know, people get bored and, and, and newsrooms hop from one thing to another to another to an, another. So people, uh, the audiences aren't invested. So, um, but, but telling good stories is really important and it is one way of getting through, but it's not enough. Uh, good content is not enough. And I think, um, you know, you said, uh, you know, how do platforms define us? Obviously, you know, we are an example and I believe you are an example. Um, and you are an example. I mean, you got come from more legacy, like print publications, but the, Coda wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the digital world. Like that's what enables us. That what gives us the voice. But the same platforms that give us a voice give voice to all sorts of other people. And the business models of the platforms that we use to reach our audiences are built around um, 
the disinformation around fake news, around clickbait. That's the stuff that spreads. So we're kind of, you know, swimming against the current. Um, and adding another layer to the problem is that uh, increasingly, look, I remember I've never, I had never been to a journalist conference be before I started CODA. You know, I was a reporter. And I remember going to my first journalist conference in about 2015 or 2016. And Facebook was like a little booth in the vendors uh, section. By the time, by tw come 2019, same journalist conference, Facebook was the main funder with the keynote address, uh, no questions allowed to ask. And we as an industry have a allowed this to happen. And there's so many newsrooms, especially, you know, across Europe and across the West, because I think, you know, once you get to Ukraine, Russia, Georgia, I think it's um, Philippines, you know, this, these are different markets and different kind of battles. But there's so many newsrooms in the West that are taking the platform money and are reporting on the consequences and the ways that platforms are reshaping and the, this delivery of information mechanisms are reshaping our um, societies, really. So I think, you know, one thing that we can do as journalists, and there are various things that other kind of actors can do, but one thing that we can do is to hold platforms accountable more. Um, and there are lots of stories that can be told and need to be told. Um, I think Ukraine, actually, Ukrainska Pravda has done some amazing work on Mm, you know, kind of exposing the role that Facebook has played uh, in, um, you know, changing and manipulating the information climate in Ukraine, where we had local journalists in eastern Ukraine fleeing Russian bombs, but also losing their communities, audiences, and businesses because of Facebook algorithms. And, you know, I think Sevgil's newsroom is one of the newsrooms that you know, has people who understand how they work and have looked into it. We've covered it as well. So we need more journalism on that, um, but also we need uh, we need to rethink uh, how you know on, on a much bigger level um, how our information space is governed. And you know, obviously, Musk and Twitter are just the most dramatic example. We'll, we'll, of get, we'll get to Musk in a minute, but yeah, and I want to come I'll to you. I have so. a lot of comments. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I will start with a um, business model. So we had a sustainable business model before the war. Uh, so it was model based on 80% uh, we received from advertising, which means programmatic uh, and um, sales. Then uh, around 10% uh, readers. We launched our club of readers in 2020, and it was pretty successful. And 10% from donors. No, it has changed dramatically after the beginning of war because we don't have advertisers and uh, programmatic didn't work for the first days of war because like a lot of people don't want to see like uh, war and uh, advertising together. Uh, but still, uh, now we depend from our donors around 60% from we receive from donors, around 10% uh, from 30% um, from advertising, and 10% from our readers. But not from even Ukrainian readers, from uh, Western audience, because uh, in Ukraine people want to donate to army, and they just also withdraw like a lot of a lot of uh, subscriptions from Ukrainska Pravda because they want to support money, and it's actually very difficult financial situation to support media. Uh, and here I want to jump to um, like discussion about platform because in the first days of war we were the second uh, visited website in our country after Google. But then, of course, uh, people switch to uh, Telegram, they switch to other um, um, popular websites owned by oligarchs, for example. And we were around like um, six or seven position. So before it was YouTube, um, Telegram, um, YouTube, uh, Facebook. And then, after this uh, missile attack on October 10th, we already became the fourth website uh, in our country after Facebook, YouTube, and Google. Uh, and uh, it's all the time happening when something, and uh, if you, people started to think about their own lives, they went uh, to uh, credible medias because uh, they want to read uh, Telegram. So, of course, of course, Telegram is growing uh, in Ukraine. So, a lot of people subscribe to different anonymous, anonymous channels, and of course, it makes me scary because uh, you don't have an owner, and uh, they also can manipulate, they also can be used by different political uh, parties, and we also publish a list of uh, Telegram channels that works for Russia, for example, in the beginning of war. Uh, and still, so, but um, when, when, when it 
it literally uh, can be um, a threat for your uh, lives, you jump back to Ukrainska Pravda. You jump to credible media. And, and, uh, okay. and uh, I want to add also about, um, uh, about storytelling and about um, uh, the meaning of uh, content. And in Ukraine, it literally helped uh, save lives and it's literally helped your country. Because, for example, you mentioned about uh, the list that we published in the beginning of war, the list of Russian yachts owned by Russian oligarchs and uh, Russian jets. And I remember how, uh, how I received a call from one of the ambassador of Western countries. And he said, could you please translate it in English? And then in the next three days, all these yachts were arrested by uh, uh, by uh, the governments of uh, these countries, which is an, is an amazing uh, example how you can impact. Um, and uh, of course, it's uh, hard to ask with, uh, to compete with um, uh, telegram channels when they, you have only one sentence. It's explosions in Kherson, explosions where, and at the same time you need to check it. Uh, you have your sources in different uh, in different uh, areas in in uh, your country, but still you can't uh, be you can, you can compete with like reaction uh, with telegram channels sometimes. Uh, but with, uh, for example, um, I mentioned before that we were focused more on domestic issues and corruption issues. And uh, uh, because of curfew, because of uh, martial law, it's hard, uh, for example, to do even investigative uh, journalism in our country. So we decided that we will launch a project about uh, our, how to say, VIP refugees uh, in different countries. And we filmed, for example, Battalion Monaco with a lot of corrupted politicians that escaped our country and now they live in Monaco. So, and this series became very popular, around one in eight million people uh, viewed in our uh, YouTube. YouTube is growing too, and this is interesting story about uh, we have now uh, only one Unite Marathon, so only one voice policy uh, in our um, uh, television. Uh, so, uh, but people they understood that maybe um, this is a good way to receive the news, and they but. They don't trust it enough, and it's only one voice, so they um, switch to YouTube. And YouTube is growing too, around 20% from the beginning of war. Uh, so we also put a lot of attention to our YouTube channel, and um, uh, we had a plan to open our uh, studio uh, before. It was postponed because of war, but we will open um, our podcast studio and video studio this uh, month. Um, so and um, we'll compete with YouTube as well. I want to come back um, before you put your mic down. <laughs> okay. I want to come back to to something that you said earlier because it's um, it sort of gets to the essence of uh, journalism and the kind of choices and decisions that we all have to make. So you mentioned earlier in the beginning introductory part about less reporting on sort of the current government and the administration and about corruption and in sh unlike. Unlike in every other country, the concern there was not about the government coming down on you. I'm, I'm assuming that you're going to be you know, shut down or shut out of business or you're going to be attacked. It's your readers who might be questioning whether you should be, even if it's perfectly legitimate, fact-based sourced information, whether you should be doing anything to criticize the Ukrainian government at a time when your country is in the fight for its existence. So uh, just talk a little bit about how you make those kinds of decisions? Oh, it's hard. It, it, it is literally hard. And uh, I remember in June, for example, we published a big investigation about our former ombudsman and her misconducts with information because she published a lot of incorrect information, for example, of sexual violence. And uh, we received thousands of thousands of negative comments. And uh, people said, OK, you want to be in like a white code during the war. Uh, it's not about journalism. It's about fighting. Uh, so you helped uh, Russian propaganda to, like, to achieve their goals, uh, to say that uh, Ukraine lied. But uh, still, a lot of, a lot of journalists uh, supported us that it was the right cho choice. And uh, you have to fight for European uh, values. And here I want to mention um, 
one of my favorite examples of uh, this uh, choice. My good friend of mine, tutor, Alan Rasbacher, who is a former editor um, of The Guardian, and he, they published a story about Snowden, and they also received dozens of negative comments. Uh, and uh, then he was invited to a, big, to a British parliament, and he received like one short question, do you love your country when you publish such stories? And he said, of course, I love, and my country is democracy. Alan Rusbridger, the editor-in-chief yes, of The Guardian. Yeah, and he said, of course, I love my country, and because democracy, uh, my country is democracy, I will fight, and one of the uh, uh, characters of uh, democracy is freedom of speech, and if I will fight for it. And of course, uh, my country is democracy at war, but it doesn't mean that for us, uh, freedom of speech is not important, and for us, it's a uh, value. Two journalists of Ukrainska Pravda were killed for the last uh, 16 years for, for this right. And uh, of course, I think that it's also like the big difference uh, maybe between the Russian market, uh, media landscape, and ours, because we were fighting all the time. And uh, in our country, for example, uh, the the murder of journalists went to the protests, for example, and first protests uh, in 2002, uh, they, were, they happened after uh, the murder of Georgi Gengadze, who was the founder of Ukrainska Pravda. So, and uh, in actually, the murder of Georgi Gengadze was um, also like a base uh, for protests in 2004. So for us, uh, the violence against person and freedom of speech are real uh, values, and we will fight for them. Uh, we're going to move to questions in a couple of minutes, but I want to ask um, the panelists each to just speak very briefly. It's the same question that I asked to the last panel. What do you need? What, 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 you know, what is going to help us uh, either achieve greater trust, greater freedom, or protect, in the case of Slovakia uh, and the Czech Republic, protect uh, the freedoms that you feel you have so in the last panel, um, some of the um, panelists talked about um, you know transparency, uh, explaining how how they work. Um, talked about um, world leaders speaking up on behalf of press freedom. So um, what can we take away that would be useful both to your own news organization um, as well as to the greater case of a pluralistic independent media? And I will, who, if, whoever would like to go first may, otherwise I will ruthlessly call on you. Anybody? 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 Uh, oh, go ahead. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Um, the, the things you mentioned are, are, are very important. You can repeat uh, them, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I mean, the, the big challenges for all of us, I think, even, even uh, in Slovakia, are, are, are fake news and... and uh, and bullying uh, and slapping and and uh, uh, these kind of things. Slapping, as in frivolous lawsuits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, um, um, so um, the and I know it's it's um, it's unimaginable for uh, in Hungary today that politicians, I mean politicians in power, would stand up against. Uh, 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 um, Journalists being bullied. <laughs> I mean, uh, independent journalists being bullied. Uh, but um, uh, some kind of a, a quality assurance system for trustworthy news would be a, would be a, a, a good. Uh, our, RSF, our friend from RSF here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, uh, okay. I didn't know. So I, 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 I'm thinking about this a lot. And and uh, uh, when you when you travel on a on a plane or a train or in a car you have these uh, assurances uh, from the industry that okay this airplane is safe enough to travel this car is safe enough to 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 drive this chair is safe enough to sit on why don't we have a, a system for for uh, I'm, I know it's difficult but there are some some uh, uh, measurements that could be taken, I mean, if you don't know the ownership of a news organization, then it's not trustworthy, come on. If you, if you, if you uh, don't know where they get the money from, they're not trustworthy, and this, is, this has nothing to do with content. This is about how they work, how, how, how trustworthy their background is. So the News Trust Initiative uh, uh, and, and several others are doing just that, and I will 
also remark, just because I can't help myself, that Twitter has this amazing system where it can't validate the information, but the blue check mark can assure you that. that the person <laughs> who's tweeting is who they say they are. It's brilliant. And it's about to disappear. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's a nice move. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You could buy it for $8 a month. Go ahead. Um, so... You know, I mean, trust is such a hot topic in journalists now, and everyone's like, well, "What do you get? How do we get the trust back? And what do we do about the trust?" And um, I, I, I kind of think we know the answer. Uh, we know what kind of journalism ultimately, you know, receives the trust of our audiences and how we build trust. And I think. I think we need to be holding up a mirror to ourselves a little bit more as an industry in journalism and saying, like, how helpful is it to actually be filling 24 hours um, a day with news because news doesn't happen uh, 24 hours a day. And, like, are we just adding to the noise? Are we just adding to that problem? Um, so, um, you know, yes, platforms help, but, like, some of it is our responsibility as well. And I think these are difficult questions that we need to be mm, asking ourselves uh, when we make editorial choices in our newsrooms. You know, do we do we keep adding to the noise or because noise is such a huge problem or do we try to, you know, add to a constructive conversation? I think if I was thinking of, like, if I were to say, like, what is the single thing that is most needed to, you know, save us today, I think it's a sense of urgency. I think the time was act was 20 years ago, 10 years ago, yesterday. Uh, the best time is now. And I think it has to concern everyone, you know. I mean, we're not talking about a lot of money to... You know, nonprofit journalism doesn't need all that much money. We need to get businesses on board. We need to get anyone with a little bit of, you know, civic consciousness on board. And we need to find ways of explaining how Ukraine is just an extreme end of a trend that ha is happening to all of us. And I really think that, you know, I'm obviously. Um, my opinion is colored by the fact that I come from a country that has also been invaded and is currently occupied by Russia. But it's not just Russia, right? Wh who is going to be next? It's Taiwan. I mean, the the order the, is being rewritten around the world. And, you know, we can see how what we saw happen in Hungary is now happening in Poland and, and so on. And it's urgency. We need urgency. We can't keep trying. You know, it's... It's basically the definition of stupidity, right? When you keep trying something that you've tried before and it hasn't worked, but you keep trying it. We need to be coming up with new solutions, new networks, new collaborations and with the sense of urgency. And I think another last thing, Sevgil and I were talking about it earlier in the conversation that I constantly have with my Russian colleagues is... You know, that big question now is like that question of collective responsibility. You know, are we collectively responsible? And I think it's a legitimate opinion to say you, are, you aren't, but it's a question that I think we should all ask News ourselves. News organizations, you mean? News organizations and us as citizens and us as journalists, you know, are we, like, is it part of our responsibility? It's something that is happening far away from us. It, uh, our responsibility, our problem, like how do we connect what's happening in Ukraine to what's happening in Slovakia, Czech Republic, Venezuela, because all of these storylines are connected. You know, Maura, Jamie talked about it very um, uh, articulately, how, you know, the experience of exile today, you know, we have Russians in Riga, we have Belarusians in Tbilisi, we have Nicaraguans in Costa Rica. They're all these journalists working activists, civil society members who are now operating out of exile. Like We need to create networks that bring them together because guess what? The reason why Nicaraguans are in Costa Rica where this space is shrinking is because Nicaragua learned from Russia and adopted a copy of the Foreign Agents Act and that went around the world too. We need to become a little bit more like them and learn from each other and we need to do that with a sense of urgency. Well said. Thank you. Should I go? Okay. Yes, please. So speaking of the Czech Republic, um, I have like three points, I think. Um, the first one, I think that we have to start talk about war, our work as a journalist, what we do, what are the challenges we, we are facing, what's the process uh, uh, behind each article, because I think 
it, the content and what I said earlier that it's not like enough, but it's also important to know um, to know what's behind this protest. We are like yeah, because how you could how you could persuade someone it's important when you when he or she doesn't know what's behind it and why it's important so this is the first point then i think it's more like structural thing that we have to like as pri private media uh rethink our current model of uh media and if if newsrooms big newsrooms are future i think that it's not, but uh, I think that we don't have uh, like another thing now. I, I I was in October to two weeks in the US uh, thanks to Fulbright, and I spent there like two weeks uh, interviewing a US journalist, and they have same problem as we have in the Czech Republic. Uh, only one uh, one difference is that they have more money because they have international uh, audience, but they also they are trying to solve how to function and how to um, how to get the money for good and quality uh, good journalism. And the last thing, it's it's really inside of media, but I think that we need some platform, uh, like functional body of journalists, like independent uh, body who could who would lead like the discussion about journalism in the Czech Republic because we have something like this but it's not it doesn't function uh, as as good as i think it could be uh, and we don't have uh, any discussion about uh, how we perceive some uh, some events in the Czech Republic how we write about things what what are the ethical thing what which are, which are not uh, etc so this is like my three points to this <laughs> okay, uh, I'm gonna be probably like uh, there is no need to to repeat things which were already mentioned. So I think we uh, we need to show that we are human beings. Journalists are human beings, and we need to show that there is uh, being a journalist means that you have a passion for it. So uh, we probably as journalists were trying for years and years and years to show that we are called professionals. I mean, uh, the, I, don't, I don't say that ob objectivity is a bad thing, but uh, we were trying to be, or the, the, uh, the, the symbol was to, to be uh, cool and <laughs> not, to be, not to be passionate. And, and I think it's wrong. I mean, we need to show that we are we are reporting and we are, we are writing about the stories around us, but we are part of the story. And, and it touches us and we have to be there and we have to show our readers that uh, we are in the same position as they are. And it means that we have to admit sometimes that we are wrong and we have to, we have to correct ourselves all the time. But it means also that we are, we are as they are and that might be the chance for us to to persuade them that they, that it, there is a need to to read and to to follow journalists and to support journalism. That sounds like that resonates with you. Uh, thank you so much. You know, um, four years ago, I dedicated my research paper, and the title was "How to Build Trust in Media When Society Is Polarized," and it was dedicated totally about Ukrainska Pravda and challenges we faced that time. And also, for the last eight years, I heard like so many times that, okay, this year Facebook will kill you, this year Telegram will kill you, this year Twitter will kill you. Okay, and also uh, oligarchs uh, created a lot of media,s and they promised they will kill Ukrainska Pravda and uh, our existence. So, but we follow our principles of our rules we are uh, together with our readers and actually talking about my research paper a paper i uh, like created like three four important points first like follow principles publish principles and rules of your uh, uh, newspaper then uh, readership model of course it's important to 
connect, to have a um, connection with your readers, and we um, organized a lot of events together with our readers. So we went to the even ecological uh, prospection, so etc. Uh, so then, uh, ombudsman position we didn't create, create it yet, but uh, we are thinking about it. And the fourth, uh, financial results, uh, transparent financial results that you can publish on your website. But still, this war. I want to say you like um, it's changed my uh, opinion about a lot of a lot of things and also the sense of existence of myself because I think that the most important thing is empathy. It's empathy for people and for your um, for your nation, for your countrymen. And I remember how. Uh, I went, for example, for uh, territories that, that they were under occupation for like months or two months, and people will literally cry when they uh, understood that I am a journalist, uh, because uh, the, and they told me that the most hardest part was uh, not being without uh, food, without uh, electricity, but the most hardest part was to to be out of news not to understand what's going on. And I remember how 28th of February, I received a call from my fr good friend of mine uh, in Mariupol. And Mariupol was already occupied. And he was crying and he told, I know that Kiev was, uh, is already surrendered. And I was trying to explain, no, it's not true. Uh, we are still fighting, please believe in that. And he was literally crying because someone in uh, Mariupol spread the news that Kiev was already surrendered. Someone, I mean, Russian soldiers and Russian propaganda. And first that Russia didn't occupy by territories, they out of uh, Ukrainian news. You know, even Telegram channels, Ukrainian Telegram channels um, are blocked uh, in uh, occupied territories. And if you, if for example, mm, uh, Russian soldiers found out uh, find uh, find out that you read Ukrainska Pravda, it means prison for you in occupied territories. Just think about it. And um, yeah, and about empathy, that journalist. Um, literally, I remember how. First weeks, uh, I helped to evacuate people. I helped uh, to bring foods to penetral centers because they know that I'm chief editor and uh, I'm a journalist. And maybe I have like very nearest contact with mayor or with politician, and they ask me to help them. And it's about it. But of course, we need a self-reflection about the meaning of profession, about uh, the empathy, and. Uh, readers trust us because we follow our principles. Of course, uh, we can live like a um, stone um, century and uh, think only about like uh, online journalism and etc. So we can exist out of uh, platforms. We use platforms, but still, the core element of our values. Thank you. Thank you. That was a wonderful articulation of the power and importance of what you do, what all of you do. We're now going to take your questions before we give you lunch. Um, so let's see. Let's. Um, who's got? Oh, got to take one of the mics. Oh. Oh, over here. This gentleman in the blue right. vest. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Jakob Weitzman. I work as a journalist in the Western Balkans, and my question is mainly about journalism education. Because one of the most gen about, what? about journalism education. Okay. Um, one of the most detrimental aspects of uh, the opp oppression of media freedom is the lack of education for journalists. Um, I, I noticed that in the Balkans, especially, that there's like a bare minimum for what qualifies as being a journalist in the newsroom. And what I want to ask to everyone in their respective countries is, what do they, what are the, what are the responsibility? That, what do you suggest the responsibility that, that your respective countries should take on in order to educate the journalists, to equip them with the tools and the capabilities to overcome? Uh, the oppression of the media freedom and um, to not sell their soul to some sort of government portal. I mean, government portals. So. So the question is: So how do what how do, how do we train upcoming r rising journalists in those in core journalistic values? Yes. Is that right? Okay. Sure. Yeah, I have um, um, two short answers. We are just launching a, a Telex Academy just for these uh, reasons, to, to have uh, uh, people, to have teachers uh, from across the country to come over to us and we will tell them um, about why journalism and independent journalism is important. And there, just one quick addition, we had an internship program for uh, 10 people last year and uh, there were 500 candidates and uh, we were shocked just like you that uh, my first question was what are you doing here what do you want what do you want to do in this field 
and they said that uh, they, 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 they want to make a change. And uh, I, I don't say that this is the, the uh, typical attitude in Hungary in the younger generations, but it, still it's a good sign. The, the advice I always give um, people who want to be journalists, um, I always say don't go to journalism school. Apology if anyone here is a professor in a journalism school. Uh, go to Telex Academy, uh, get an internship in the newsroom, but study history, study philosophy, or I think we as an industry, I think it's you know, so important to bring people from other fields into the profession as well. I think some of the best journalists are doctor, people who used to be doctors or biologists or, you know, come from IT and have different perspective and, and a bigger mind. So no journalism school. Uh, if you want to do humanities, history is what I recommend. Yeah, I'm also a lawyer, so uh, I, I, I didn't study uh, journalism, but I, yeah, it's also, it's good to have like some specific knowledge about some really, you know, uh, field as economy or law or biology or etc. because you have advantage like in front of you when you just enter the profession. But you ask also about the core values. Um, many newsrooms in the Czech Republic, I think that they have like really strong tradition to work with journalists. Uh, there are a lot of internship. We have open internship also, not only for people f who study ju journalism, but also from like other other areas. So maybe it's, you, I think that you can gain uh, these values through everyday work in these newsrooms, like not not in at everyone, you, at, uh, all newsrooms in the Czech Republic, but most of them are good at uh, working with journalists. And I would say you couldn't uh, make a mistake when you, you know, go to the public radio, go to the some private uh, private media such as Respect, Denik N, which is the, like the sister of Slovak Denik N in Slovakia, and other other uh, newsrooms. So I think that's the best way how to like sense these values. Oh, sorry. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, we have uh, a school of journalism, and this school of journalism was created by Pavel Shremet in 2015, and in the dedication of his memory, we still continue. And already we have seven members of uh, Ukrainska Pravda team uh, from this school, uh, like uh, alumni of uh, the school for the last, um, how many, six, six years. Uh, and um, I love young generation, and I think that... Um, Mm. An editorial team, uh, like Ukrainska Pravda editorial team is unique because we have uh, people that work, for example, we, who work with uh, Georgi Gangadze and who remember uh, him, so in, from 2000. Uh, and uh, we have a young generation, and 22, 23 years old, and I love them because they bring some, something new uh, in our newsroom. And, I, and they're so great, you even learn from them. For example, our youngest reporter, frontline reporter, war reporter, she's just 23 years old, and she's extremely brave. So I ask her not to come to some front lines uh, and uh, frontline territories, which are really, really scared. And she went to them. So, And I learned from her, actually, which is, which is great. And I think that it's also about... Um, uh, that you need, you need to create a, your team in your media with different generation, with different perspective, uh, to keep your institutional memory and to have new uh, new generation and new energy. I think I'll <clears throat> I'll answer your question. That uh, understand the question as the there is a need to change the the education, but in journalism because uh, in the last twenty years we journalism changed so so much that it didn't change that much in the last 100 years before. And as I see it, uh, the journalistic schools that are not adopting to it uh, as fast as it's, as it's happening, which is, I mean, uh, understandable because it's really going uh, too fast. So therefore, I would, I would believe that there is a, there's a chance to 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 learn more about journalism in in newsrooms than in than in schools, I mean 
I studied journalism and then I studied international relations, but uh, I started working in a newspaper when I was 19 and that was my university. And and that's it for even today because uh, the best jur- best journalists, I mean, some of the best journalists in our newsroom are people who, st- who attended the newsroom in, in their early 20s and they're still there with us and uh, they're the best ones because they they feel the rules, they feel the mm, standards, uh, and might be that they, they like the job. <laughs> Certainly learn by doing. Okay, let's go to the next question. And we don't have, not everybody has to answer every question. I will be very quick. Okay, um, then we'll come here. Yeah, yes, uh, you have been talking about quality journalism, and I was wondering, uh, I mean, what, what's happening with people who are young, who are about 20, who definitely are lost for legacy media and are not the, the target group, the readers? Is it something also in terms of sustainability that worries you, that you are trying to engage them, that you are trying to explain some media literacy, what's the difference between social media, information, and quality journalism? Thank you. Just take one or two answers. We don't have to have um, to everybody. So if you feel, go ahead. Um, you know, I also always feel that like this whole question of like young, we need the young audiences. We need young audiences. It's like the holy grail of journalism, and it never like no one ever has a solution because. You know, I think people come to serious journalism a little bit later in life, and they're a little bit, majority of them, a little bit less interested in their 20s and 30s, and I think it's it's also okay. I'm not sure there is a need. I mean, there are lots of, obviously, broadcasters and publications that target specifically young readers, and that's great. Um, and... Um, you know, have programs that target uh, young readers and and so on. But um, I also think it's uh, like, I think we're kidding ourselves a little bit when we think that someone is going to crack it. I don't think anyone will. I think they'll they'll come. We just need to trust that they'll come. I may be totally wrong, obviously. Hi, my name is Anna Zomic. I work for a Czech NGO, People in Need. I have a question to uh, Mr. Matusz Kostolny about Slovakia. Um, Slovakia is among the nations in Europe that has had this infamous title of being one of the most prone to disinformation and conspiracy theories. I wonder how does it affect your position in the market as an independent media outlet? And also, do you actually do anything to reach out to those audiences who believe, for example, like in a recent poll, that 52% of Uh, 52% of Slovaks said in recent poll that actually they want Russia to win the war. Yeah, I mean, we are trying to do our best. So we are, we have, we have professionals, we have specialists who specialize on on this information. Uh, we didn't have uh, such a function 10 years ago. Now we have uh, colleagues who are writing only about these uh, kind of stories, and and they have all the time to do something. So there is a lot of it. Um, To be honest, uh, I'm not trying to reach to those people because uh, if somebody is supporting Russia in these de- in these days, I think it's already lost in their minds. Uh, I hope it's not 50, 52% of uh, people in Slovakia. We have different polls, uh, different surveys saying that there's it's not that much people. Uh, probably there is a little chance to persuade them that they're wrong. Uh, and what's interesting to me is that, uh, if not media, what is the role of politicians in, in that, uh, story? Because, uh, our politicians, they are, um, talking those kind of uh, things which support those disinformation. They, uh, they are up to it. They, they don't like journalists and they attack them. And they are part of the story that they say that, look, these journalists, are not, they are not trustworthy because this and this and this. Uh, and I think it's, it's important to, to say that um, we are doing our jobs. We are trying to do uh, professional, quality journalism. If you trust us, we're happy. If not, then it's up to you. I mean... <laughs> There is no chance to to tell people that she, they have to trust you. We have well, just time for one last question in the, in the back. 
I'm uh, Jan Dajanček. I'm the publishing editor of uh, Aspen Review, which is a magazine published by the Central European uh, Aspen. And I have a question. Uh, what can we as media or what are you as media doing to um, fight or yeah, to just strive uh, against populist, populist um, in politics? What do you do for striving, um, let's say, free press uh, in terms of content in working with uh, the readers? Because we talk about a lot about uh, how the system could go, how we could... Um, engage young people, young journalists, uh, how we can, or in the pre previous panel, how to um, influence politicians. But um, I may be somehow missing uh, the best practices about how to work with, with the audience, um, yeah, in terms of audience itself and the content. What, what is your advice? I might be just the only one. I want to make sure that I understand the question. Saying, how can you help the audience understand the rise of populism? Or did I not understand it? Sorry. Maybe that could be the question, but okay. also... <laughs> no, it could be your question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, do we actually understand the audience? Because... Uh -huh. how, okay. Yeah, because the, the populists are... Uh, or the people are listening to the populace. I see, okay. And my question would be, how can we, wh what can we do as, as media, as journalists, to, uh, to fight with it, or what are the okay. best ways? Is it how can we counteract the message yeah. that's coming from the populace to help the audience understand? Well, um, but <laughs> there's an easy answer to that. I mean, you have to communicate with them. That's the only chance, I guess. I mean, uh, you, you have to communicate. You have to ask them. You have to um, um, count what their uh, interest is, and 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 um, you just have to communicate a lot. It's it's tough. It's a lots of work, but there's no other options, I guess. I uh, I think there's other options. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I think uh, diverse newsrooms are really, really important. I think we need to build newsrooms that reflect societies that we live in and are not populated. That's why, you know, like we don't offer unpaid internships. We will pay for internships or we will give, you, you know, take interns who get university credit. But, you know, because you, that that's how you end up with you know, rich kids uh, rising through the ranks in journalism, which is nothing against them. They're brilliant and talented and skilled and everything, but they do not represent the societies that we live in. So I think that one, and then, you know, report on, report with patience and empathy on uh, people who try to understand where people come from. There is a reason why populist politicians are, on the rise, uh, they have compelling arguments that resonate with people and we need to understand them. I have just one thing. I think that people should, or readers should see themselves in articles. Like these articles should reflect a little bit their lives, their experience, their problems. You know, we are facing energy crisis. So they should know that what's what's going on. Uh, they They saw, you know, you... You that uh, respect wrote about it, and they care about their problems, etc. Et so I think that's that's the one of the solution, maybe. That's a well, thank you for that. So that's about all the time we have. I want to um, thank um, this wonderful panel. First of all, the only satisfied journalist I've ever met in my life, <laughs> um, and we are watching um, and and hoping conditions remain good for press freedom in Slovakia and the Czech Republic. We are watching very carefully what is happening in Hungary and Georgia, and hoping to see reverses. And most of all, Sevgil, we are um, all of us. I know I speak for this room and everybody watching. We are all rooting for you and. Um, and for, the, and for the country of Ukraine to prevail. So thank you. Thank you to the audience. Thank you very much for joining us. And I think now we have, oh, now I'm turning no, it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for, as you, as, as you say, so we, and thank you very much for joining us. And thank you very much that you are part of the event of the Aspen. We will continue with this topic. So this was not only the start, but I think the importance of the free speech of the media and democracy in this region is quite important. So that's why there'll be other events. Uh, and once more, uh, Vivian, thank you very much for the great cooperation 
and, and that you have been chairing the, the today's two panels. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right.